Welcome, welcome, welcome. Good morning. Thank you for joining uh, for this webinar. My name is Iguma Gabriel and we are so glad on behalf of CASO that you're joining us to have this discussion. So you're very welcome. Would like to give uh, about a minute for everyone that uh, every attendee to log in before we can start with our discussion for today. But I'll let you know that uh, all our panelists are already in and uh, we're ready to have a great discussion with you. So again, you're very, very welcome. As we wait for more people to log in, I'd like to just share with you our program for today. So on your screen is our program for the day. You could just go through it as uh, we wait for a few more people to log in and we'll be able to start. So this webinar is coming to you mainly on the Zoom platform, but we are also on social media, particularly uh, CASO's Facebook and Twitter pages. So whatever platform you are using to join us today, you are very welcome and you will be able to contribute to the discussion. Today we'll be using two hashtags. The hashtag we've been using for this series, which is uh, CASO webinar. And then the second hashtag, which is specific for today's webinar is Thrive health. So especially for the people on social media, please use those hashtags so that we're able to pick up your comments uh, when you put them on social media. All right, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. And uh, I hope Mrs. Angelina Twinomujuni is uh, available to lead us in a word of prayer. Angelina? Let's pray. It, Father, we thank you. Greatness, O oh Lord, and new mercies. See, we thank you on health delivery systems in Uganda. We are reminded, we ask you for wisdom for all the panelists as they make requests commands this sector that you will use this as a flag good news and recommendations that can be to support the trans in Jesus name we've prayed and believed amen 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 thank you very much Angelina and thank you everyone for uh, being here this morning. Dear uh, attendees, we're glad that you're joining us, whether it is on Zoom, Twitter, or uh, Facebook. We will be using the hashtags Castle Webinar and Thrive Health. Please make sure you use those hashtags if you are commenting so that we're able to pick up on your comments. We have a rapporteuring team that's making sure that everything that's discussed makes it to the report that will uh, come out at the end of this webinar. We'll be, we're interested in hearing from you. So please use the Q and A tab at the bottom of your screen. So at the bottom of your screen, and for some devices, it could be on the side, there is a tab labeled Q and A. So anytime during this discussion, you can use that in order uh, to get in touch with us. Our panelists who are all logged in now will be able to visit uh, that tab to respond to your questions. We will also use uh, poll questions to get your opinion on uh, certain things on uh, health delivery systems. So every 30 or so minutes, we'll have a poll show up on your screen. Uh, just uh, 
pick out the option that uh, best applies to you and uh, we will be able uh, to get a feel of uh, what majority of us uh, think of particular things in relation to our health sector. Now, this series of webinars has been organized by the Center for Advanced Strategic Leadership, CASO. So at this juncture, I would like to invite the board chairman, uh, Dr. James Magara, to make some remarks on behalf of CASO as our conveners. Over to you, Dr. Magara. Thank you very much, Gabriel, and a very warm welcome to our panelists, uh, uh, Dr. Kadama, uh, Dr. Ian Clark, uh, Dr. Olive Kobusinje, Dr. Idro, and our very special guest, Dr. Charles Solaro. Uh, thank you very much for honoring this time. We do appreciate uh, uh, the extremely busy and uh, Saturday morning is one of those times when most people take time off to do things outside the office. So we really appreciate the, the honor that you put on this meeting and be very honored by your presence. Also very special uh, welcome to, uh, the, uh, to this uh, webinar. As already mentioned, uh, the Castle Think Tank, when the pandemic struck, we decided to focus on opportunities. And uh, through our membership in the month of April, we held a, a large brainstorming workshop that lasted about six hours. And, and then we, uh, it was multi-sectoral. And then we decided uh, after reviewing the ideas that came up to come up with some papers and then engage the public and uh, uh, have these kinds of discussions. We've had, uh, this should be the 12th, 12th or 13th in the series. Uh, it doesn't end here. The ideas that come from here are, uh, extracted and uh, put in um, the bigger document and uh, the next phase which is ongoing is uh, engaging decision makers policy makers policy briefs stakeholders so we expect uh, what comes out of here to go further and play a part in helping us think through uh, the challenges we are faced with so thank you once again for <clears throat> joining in the conversation this morning uh, we look forward to your expert views on the panel. Uh, we have uh, open conversations. We, um, it's not like a radio show where you can talk over each other, but uh, we, do, we do have very measured conversations and we listen. We, we want you to bring out uh, you know, the, the, the best. It has been said ideas rule the world. And so we hope that some of the ideas that come out of this panel will contribute to the ruling of the sector, health sector. Thank you very much and uh, wish you a very good and fruitful discussion this morning. Over to you, Gabriel. Thank you very much, Dr. Magara. I think he had to mention it's not a radio show because I host a radio show and uh, probably he wanted to remind me, today is not radio, people can see me. So yes, again, you're all very welcome. A special welcome to our attendees who uh, continue to log in and stream in. Uh, Dr. Magara mentioned that we've had uh, webinars before this one. This is actually the 13th. So if you missed any of the 12 that came before this, just visit CASO's uh, Facebook page. Uh, this conversation is going live onto Facebook. And actually, after the conversation, you can go to CASO's Facebook page and you'll be able to uh, review, you know, uh, our discussion today, which is the same thing with all the 12 that came before this. They are on that page and you can be able to follow. Our special guest today is uh, Dr. Charles Olaro. He is Director Health Services, Curative Services, Ministry of Health. Uh, we also have Dr. Miriam Mutabazi. She's a Senior Lecturer, Department of Matano and Child Health. Uh, that's from Uganda Christian University. Our discussants are Dr. Olive Kobusinje. She's a senior research fellow, School of Public Health, Macquarie University. We also have uh, Dr. Ian Clark. He's the chairman, Uganda Healthcare Federation. We have Dr. Richard Idro, the president of the Uganda Medical Association. And we have Dr. Patrick Kadama, executive director, African Platform on Human Resources for Health. Those are our panelists for today. When I am in, uh, when I am welcoming each one of them to speak, I will give you a more in-depth introduction 
of who they are and what they have done. And I, I can guarantee you that uh, each of these has uh, done quite a bit in the sector. But uh, without further ado, let's get into the discussion for today. And this discussion is on health delivery systems. Though a healthy population uh, forms the basic for any advancement uh, of any nation, Uganda has not reason to give healthcare the priority that it truly deserves. Some have described the health delivery systems as sick themselves. It is understandable that uh, with a small national pass, with the budget uh, being competed for by very many different sectors, the money available for uh, health may not be as much as we want. However, more could be done. And uh, to fund the health sector, especially uh, critical parts of the health sector. It's actually ironical that in one breath, we say that there isn't enough money. And in another, government spends billions of shillings annually to treat uh, people outside of this country. What would happen if these resources were actually invested within the country? The pandemic has showed us that uh, the health systems in country should be able to deal with the conditions of the people within the country. So as we have the discussion today, what opportunities have been revealed by the COVID-19 pandemic? And where do we start from to ensure that our health delivery services can work for us as a people? To kick us off, we are going to have a presentation of a think piece that was put together by CASO, and uh, this will be delivered by Dr. Miriam Mutabazi. Dr. Miriam Mutabazi is a senior lecturer in the Department of Maternal and Child Health, Uganda Christian University. She's also the director of Save the Mothers East Africa. Her research interests are focused on maternal and child health. Her key publications include improving maternal health and reducing mortality, access to clean, safe water, sexual and reproductive health and rights, innovations for better maternal and family health. She holds a medical degree, MBCHB, a Master of Medicine, Obstetrics and Gynecology degree from Makere University, a diploma in Health System Management from Galilee International Management Institute, Israel. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Miriam Mutabazi, and uh, doctor, you're welcome to deliver the think piece. Thank you very much, Gabriel, and uh, a very good morning to my colleagues and fellow panelists. Uh, good morning, too, to our attending participants. I'm greatly privileged to present on behalf of the Castle Think Tank uh, our thoughts on COVID-19 opportunity to thrive for the health delivery systems. Um, COVID-19 came to light in the late uh, 2019, December, late um, 2019. And the World Health Organization declared it a public health emergency of international concern on the 30th of January, 2020. And uh, uh, she declared it a global pandemic on the 11th of March, 2020. The disease has since spread to all regions and countries of the world. And globally, as of 14th August, 2020, there have been 21,102,920 confirmed cases of COVID-19 worldwide. And uh, 758,036 deaths have been reported to WHO. The nature and rapid spread of the virus and its associated impacts have riveted the world and overwhelmed even the health systems of developed countries. The impact on health systems is worse in our poor resource countries, particularly low and middle income countries and the closure of international borders has, and has caused a disruption of um, 
import of transport, importation of essential medical supplies, further constraining the health systems and delivery of the much needed medical services and care. Most health systems were not prepared to handle a large number of patients needing intensive care support. The COVID-19 pandemic has underscored the importance of urgently rethinking and repositioning our health sector to meet the ever increasing demand for health care by our rapidly growing population. Though a healthy population forms the basis for any advancement of any nation, Uganda hasn't yet risen to giving health care the priority that it truly deserves. It is understandable that with a small national purse, budgeting and availing all necessary resources could be a challenge. However, more could be done to fund the health sector. The healthcare sector budget allocation saw a drop from 9.2% for 2018-2019 national budget to 8.9% in the 2020-2021 national budget. It should also be noted that the health ministry receives significant budget support from foreign governments and development partners. Efforts in place have tried to enforce a referral system from lower level health centers being used for access to basic health care for simple ailments uh, to advanced health care services scaling up to the district, regional, and all the way to the National Referral Hospital at Mulago and Butabika. The care is in accordance with the appropriate, uh, it's, this is in accordance with the appropriate health care for the gravity or complication of the ailments. And this system has largely remained ineffective. Functionally, this implies access to health care services, but we know that the key determinants for choice of health facility uh, by Ugandans is perceived by, um, is determined by one's perception of the quality of care and also by one's spending capacity. Looking at the organization of the health sector, the Uganda health system is composed of private and public sectors. The public se sector consists of government health facilities under the Ministry of Health and is hierarchical, hierarchical and decentralized at the district level, with a health center too at the parish level, led by a nurse and service, services provided for about 5,000 people. And we have the health center three at sub-county level, led by a clinical officer, Health Center 4 at the sub health sub-district level, uh, servicing about 100,000 people. And we have a district hospital uh, and referral units, usually headed by a medical officer special grade. The private sector includes uh, private for profit and private not for profit. And uh, the providers are legisla uh, uh, license, legislation licenses them and they're regulated by the Uganda Medical Dental Practitioners Council. The key focus areas for the health sector have been infrastructure development, predominantly construction or reconstruction of facilities, for example, at Mulago Specialized Hospital. And we also know of uh, the hospi referral hospitals at Chirudu and Kawimpe. Commodity supply chain management, especially for medicines and vaccines, falls under the national medical stores, joint medical stores, and medical access collectively regulated by the National Drug Authority. Research has also been a key, a key area for the health sector, particularly for ailments such as HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria. Research, though, to a great extent, has been dependent on the nature and interest of our funders and thus determining the extent of our ability to domesticate the outcomes and the usage um, of the results. Treatment of infectious diseases such as HIV, malaria, and waterborne illnesses has been most prominent in the business of the health sector, with a small focus on chronic illnesses like cancers, cardiac diseases, and other um, um, special illnesses. Human resources, particularly training and remuneration. Key players for standards regulation are the Medical Dental Profes uh, Prof Professional Council, 
Nurses and Midwives Professional Council, the Allied Health Council. But market forces are also playing a big part in determining our ability to retain our skilled labor force. The retention of health workers is still very low, given that even with government investing heavily in training and remuneration, we still lose uh, a big percentage of our health care uh, providers to the brain drain. While there has been some effort to improve the quality and quantity of the health workforce, more investment is needed in training and uh, creating an environment in which they can work, satisfactorily work. Retaining our highly skilled labor is a challenge when incentives are inadequate and there is need to go further and even attract Ugandans who have been trained and work abroad so that they can assist in leapfrogging our nation's health sector with their skills, experience and networks. Looking at Uganda's vision 2040, this proposes a paradigm shift in the following key areas. A shift from a facility-based to a household-based health delivery system, with the main thrust being to empower households and communities to take greater control of disease prevention by promoting health practices, healthy practices and lifestyles. This shift will be anchored on preventive over curative health service delivery approaches. Another key health strategy is improvement of nutrition status of the population, especially for young women, for young children and women in the reproductive age. Government is looking towards more public-private partnerships, as well as partnerships with other developed countries to focus on building highly specialized healthcare services to treat the specialized medical conditions that are currently being treated abroad. Also in plan is the strategy to construct and equip regional hubs of excellence in each of the proposed regional cities, particularly with international and national hospitals. What are the main trends pre-COVID? We've had uh, private versus public health care utilization, an increasing number of Ugandans seek health care in private facilities. And in terms of global utilization of health care services, the key destinations for Ugandan patients are India, Kenya, and South Africa. It has been reported that uh, government spends about 450 billion shillings, spent 455 billion shillings in 2016, for the treatment of uh, majorly public officers in these facilities abroad. And even when it comes to our pharmaceutical industries, we have a few local manufacturers like Abacus, Sipla Quality Chemicals and others. But the raw materials they use come from China, India and other parts of the world. So what are the gaps exposed and challenges posed by this pandemic? First, we have an absence of digitized medical records or even data on everything like logistics and other related records for decision-making. This results in delays due to time spent on information collected, analyzed, and leading to a delay in decision-making, which can be catastrophic in the face of a fast spreading and dangerous pandemic like COVID-19. We must leverage our developing capacities in the ICT, science, technology, and innovation sector to close this gap. Inadequate equipment and supplies, we've already noted, insufficiency of um, personal protective equipment, uh, ICU facilities, and human resources like nurses to be able to attend to the sick. There are low levels of confidence Ugandans have in homegrown health resources. This is both in the system and the products. The lack of faith in our local human resource has diminished development of some of the entities that would have added professional support to the fight against COVID-19. It is this same local human resource that we have often overlooked that is now behind the spectacular recovery rate of COVID-19 patients. This attitude against our local resources should change across board from the leaders to the people so that we strengthen the, um, the health facilities at all level. We should also build faith in our own local 
system and capabilities. There are gaps in the referral system, especially due to the inability of people to call for medical assistance due to the COVID lockdown. This has especially affected the rural communities. However, we've noted the lifting of the ban has led to access, increased access to transportation for health-related conditions. And uh, this is a major solution to the matter. Um, in this COVID-19, we've seen that uh, minimal funding for healthcare in the national budget. Um, and this is an occasion for which to, uh, which uh, the ministry has used um, this occasion to request for supplementary budgets and do fundraising from public and well-wishers. Now, had the sector been appropriately funded, the COVID-19 pandemic would simply have required the reallocation of funds from one department to another within the sector or ministry budget allocation. Uh, we ha also have noted a lack of differentiation of integrated nature of the healthcare system. There's evidence for over-reliance of the same group of health human resource to address a host of health conditions. For example, if uh, the health workers are engaged in a campaign for immunization of children, uh, when COVID-19 came aboard, immunization suffered a standstill. The same workforce is now attending to COVID-19 patients. We also sense there's a lack of room for creativity for the young brains in the rank and file. Those in the key decision-making roles have not provided space for the creativity of young brains within their rank and files. For this creativity in the long run can be very resourceful in generating possible solutions when such outbreaks as COVID-19 happen. We take note that politics at the lower level, district level, sub-county, stifles and delays funding and human resource staffing for the lower level health centers, which also affects the capacity for response in the event of a pandemic. So what are the opportunities we see? The pandemic has created an opportunity for the health sector to be heard, implying an opportunity for sector leaders and stakeholders to negotiate for required logistics, equipment, facilities, and others required for improving the sector on the whole, not just for COVID-19, but generally. It has created opportunity for the health sector to use available channels or even develop new ones to engage and share information with the public. The future of health is community members accessing a lot of information. Therefore, sector leaders, we must democratize and make, it, make health information readily available. Additionally, the role of social media in risk communication as it is, is a huge source of information as has been displayed. So opportunities for development of IT applications which can reach the community has also come to the fore. The COVID-19 has created an opportunity for the health sector to revisit its record keeping mechanisms. It can implement conventional approaches like creating a GPS grid and address for citizens. And also there's an opportunity to develop capabilities of the village health system, which can be used and developed for preventive care and health promotion beyond what it has right now. Uh, there's been an opportunity created for a multi-sectoral approach for, to create linkages for the health uh, sector to build access and cost of health care for the end users using multi-sectoral approaches. Engaging players, for example, in the water environment sector to make more water available um, and sustain the gains, particularly for hand washing. There's also an opportunity to revisit the provision of health insurance for all. There's opportunity for leveraging partnership and relationships of non-state actors in healthcare initiative, like all the faith-based institutions, can be engaged as education platforms and enforcement of public health measures, and also tap into their organizational structure, which can be very resourceful and effective. The media, for example, radio, television, 
are also stakeholders for such community education engagement. We can have faith-based healthcare services with all faiths sending, encouraging health workers to go out as missionaries and offer preventive and curative health services. Take the opportunity of online workshops to replace the face-to-face -face meetings and save on costs related to per diem, transport refund, and all this can be channeled to other priority areas in healthcare delivery. There is also an opportunity in developing and expanding the reach of telemedicine as a means of closing the health services access gap. So we've seen the opportunity of strengthening health hygiene practices like hand washing, as well as inculcating them as disciplines and making them part of our culture. So what do we recommend as Castle? Let there be an increase in funding to the health sector according to our Abuja declaration up to 15% of the national budget. And this can be done incrementally over a period of five years with priority going to more funding for community health care strengthening the public health department at the Ministry of Health. Acceleration of the digitalization of health infrastructure and records. Refocusing on partner engagement, especially with the private sector. We're now seeing that a significant part of our population makes their first treatment call to a private health facility. And yet the private health sector is not sufficiently engaged in the health delivery system. Local sourcing of raw materials to manufacture medicines and other supplies locally, as we've seen, sanitizer and, um, and uh, face masks, this should be promoted and sustained. Activation and prioritization of the national emergency and ambulance system, this would be best augment, augmented by the setting up of a national GPS grid system to enable easy location and pickup of individuals in need of medical assistance. Adopting of a multi-sectoral approach to all aspects of the healthcare spectrum. This includes, but is not limited to funding, monitoring, training, remuneration, infrastructure development. So I conclude, as the world faces an uncertain future, there must be a focus on tapping from the immense resources of our disposable at our disposal, both as human and technical resources, as well as materials. COVID-19 has opened our eyes to a number of things that we've been importing unnecessarily, like the masks and sanitizers. And this change must be sustained. There's need to devise methods of developing and expanding our local pharmaceutical raw materials and finished goods capabilities that will feed our local needs and that of the African market. We must tap from the value chain of medicine, the large amount of money spent in medical tourism, even for conditions that can be addressed locally, must now be channeled to other areas of the healthcare and cause improvement in service delivery. If there's proper response to the challenges posed by the pandemic, ultimately there'll be a decreased burden of disease increased focus on health and wellness, and health, hence increased productivity of the citizens in general. Thank you very much for listening to me. And um, this piece was compiled by a brainstorming workshop by Castle in, in April. A multi-sectoral group reviewed the information, making additions to and adjustments before the lead pro writers produced this thing piece. And this is still a working document. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much. Back to you, Gabriel. Thank you very much, Dr. Miriam Mutalazi. And like she ended, this is a work in progress. So we would like to hear from you. Uh, what should be added in this document? Uh, what adjustments should be made? Because at the end of the day, we want to make sure that uh, the health sector actually works for us. Now. We did mention that uh, for, a nation, for a nation to develop, the people have got to be healthy. For the health sector to move to where we want it to be, the workforce should be capable, should be equipped, should be motivated to actually 
do the work. Is that the actual uh, reality on ground? We're going to move to our first discussant, Dr. Patrick Kadama. He is the executive director of the African Platform on Human Resources for Health, which is hosted at the African Center for Global Health and Social Transformation, a chest. It's here in Kampala, Uganda. He joined the chest about five years ago uh, to take up the position of director for policy and strategy, which he still concurrently holds, working on health governance and health workforce issues. He was previously at uh, the World Health Organization, uh, that is the headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland, where he was advising on country health policies and strategies for delivery of services to attain better and equitable health outcomes. He's a physician, health planner, economist with uh, over 25 years in health policy analysis, planning, and financing. He was head of uh, health sector planning in Uganda Ministry of Health before he joined uh, WHO headquarters in Geneva as an advisor on health policy and approaches to health systems uh, strengthening at the country level. He holds a medical degree, MBCHB uh, from Akeri University and is specialized in clinical tropical medicine at the London School. Uh, he also undertook a research degree in health planning and financing and studied uh, healthcare management at Harvard School of Public Health. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's now welcome Dr. Patrick Kadama. Over to you, doctor. Good morning once again to all our viewers. And uh, I must thank Castle for giving us this opportunity to uh, participate uh, in this uh, discourse. I was not given a specific task or a specific question to address, but given the broadness of the topic we are discussing this morning, I'd put it this way, this is a very good beginning. This paper lays out a, a foundation upon which we can build uh, to uh, present a framework of opportunities uh, that we can take forward uh, to strengthen the health system in light of the experience over the last three and for some countries six months uh, that we have had uh, with the COVID pandemic. The paper is structured traditionally. And I think this is something we need to grow out of. We need to rethink, particularly given the uh, experience we have just had with COVID, how we reposition health systems uh, to be perceived as a social construct rather than a technical construct. It is a construct of society to respond to ill health, to respond to challenges to health in society, rather than a construct of technical people uh, to keep people healthy. It is the, dri the driver for health system functionality is the demand side. It is the needs and responses uh, that society expects uh, from us. So I'll begin by saying that we have key opportunities here to address health system challenges on the demand side first and foremost. I think COVID has shown us uh, what was said earlier on, I think it was 15 years ago or so, we made, a, we, we made a small book from where I was working in Geneva that health system strengthening is everybody's business. It is not the business of just healthcare providers. Uh, you will all remember that book. It was probably criticized largely because it had a supply side focus. It introduced what are called the six building blocks of the health system. And later on, we were asked to say more about participation. But the fact that COVID and its control is going to be driven by what society does, 
three things. One, to ensure personal hygiene. It is going to be society to change the way they behave, the way they look after themselves to ensure that they stop transmission of this condition. This will be done in the homestead. The strength of a homestead, it was said long ago, if you remember the OWO Commission report of 1987. First thing which Honorable Bunda took up at that time after they emerged from the Bush War was to set up a health service commission. And this commission recommended first and foremost that the girl child should be educated. Everybody criticized this. They said, we are looking for medicines and you are telling us to educate girls. Why is the girl child prioritized by the OWO Commission? It was found that a child only, a girl child only needs four to six years of education in primary school to change household, household outcomes, health outcomes. This is a huge effort. Now we need to wake up to what is happening at the household level and what we are doing to empower those who change health outcomes at the household level. People who are saying they have no food, people who have no water and soap to wash their hands mean that probably they have not been having water and soap to wash their hands. It is those households who are better organized who will come out probably probably stronger. I don't want to go much further on this one, but I think the point is made uh, that we have a huge task at the household level. The more uh, what I would call the social response, again on the demand side, is to do with encouraging society, but also social structures like sectors to work more closely together. Sectors are an economic construct. This is something that we as economists, I studied economics uh, at the London School of Economics. And one thing I learned at that time is that th these, you can change them as you see most fit for your situation. You can create as many ministries as you want uh, when you are the leader of government. It is up to how you want to structure them to respond to social needs. Uh, that uh, and economic productivity uh, that you structure them, but they are not watertight compartments. The success of one sector depends on the functionality of all the others. And that is where we sometimes miss the boat. And the outcome uh, from the COVID uh, 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 the pandemic is going to depend very much on how we influence other sectors uh, to take this forward. In special reference to this, I think the Auditor General's report of 2017, 2018 had special recommendation. I have not had anybody responding to this. It said, if we do not do something about occupational safety and health in workplaces, we shall face serious ch challenges. Uh, when we have attacks such as this one. He was not a prophet, uh, but what he said is coming to pass. We are having a problem lifting the lockdown because we did not do very simple uh, recommendations laid out in the Auditor General's report of OHS Act of the government of Uganda about two or three years ago before anybody thought about COVID. These are issues that we must be rethinking now. They are to do with health, but they are not in the health sector. We need to be thinking how we take opportunity to refocus the health strategies, our health drive to influencing factors that drive health outcomes. And I, I think I've talked too much. I'll say something on the supply side. The supply side, I would say we are well organized. She went through the organization of the health care system in this country at present. While we are still organized this way, we probably need to be rethinking uh, how we structure 
the uh, what I call service health service outlet units. How do societies access these? At the School of Public Health, I sometimes have interactions with them. There has been a concept and there is a developing fellowship, I think, on what they call a family health care practice or something very, very much similar to that. There will be people who know better about this. This has not grown to the extent one would have liked. When I, I worked with the healthcare family practice uh, uh, development and expansion in Thailand, we worked with some of my colleagues at, uh, with whom I was working at the school of uh, London School of, of, of Tropical Medicine. And it is based on how we structure this to ensure that delivery of services is around the household that we are able to later on develop what you call a health insurance system. You will not develop a responsive and acceptable to all sectors in the economy, a, a health system or health system insurance, unless you have a properly organized service delivery system that people are willing to invest further over and above public resources. So we are going to have the first challenge as to how to ensure that a basic package of services that is responsive to households across the country, across all strata of income in society is delivered. Uh, we will have to change the traditional uh, facility set up in the hierarchy that was described earlier uh, by our presenter. Uh, the 2008 report, World Health Report on uh, uh, reviving primary health care, which you might recall, had some proposals on this, how to go about creating a network, a network around households that responds to community or household challenges to their health and drives their health outcomes. Uh, this is something we've got to rethink again. There are four aspects to what we call universal health coverage. Uh, I think we have paid a lot of attention to some of them, uh, but we have paid very little attention to the fourth element, uh, which was referred to as social safety nets. Most people live in their houses. Most people look after themselves they don't stay in hospitals or health centers. That is where we've got to focus. Keep them in their houses, keep them healthy, and ensure that they have confidence that should they have a need beyond what is in the household, they can turn to us uh, to deliver uh, or, or, or on that. Right. There was, uh, uh, maybe I'd better be stopping here, but just talking about the re restructuring, uh, 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 the, the, the sector, let us ensure that our focus on infrastructure development on supplies is based on a strong foundation of human resources. In 1999, we produced the first health policy document. It was really improved health policy document. Because well, there's been policy documents before that since 1956, they have been there. Uh, but this document made one particular uh, point that if you want to develop infrastructure, ensure ahead of that, you have the human resources to drive the infrastructure. Otherwise, redundant infrastructure is expensive, wasteful, and actually leads to decline in services, not a rise in service delivery. Uh, we have to pay particular attention to that. And at present, I don't see a balance between this. And what we need is to create a balance between uh, service provision of health facilities, some people call it curative, and what we do to the demand side, uh, what sometimes is called public health, and ensure that we have the legal frameworks, we have the policy frameworks uh, that drive our 
uh, 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 development initiatives in order for us to meet uh, and be responsive uh, to our societies. I think I'd like to stop there, uh, Mr. Chairman. I've spoken for too long and I do apologize. I have personal challenge, uh, yes. so I may not be with you uh, for the entire period. I may have to leave. I, actually, I have to leave after another 40 or so minutes. All right. So for the, I ask for your apology. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kadam, for uh, that presentation. And yes, uh, you brought it to our attention that you would have to leave. And that's why I would like to actually put one or two questions to you uh, so that uh, later on during the Q&A, when you're not available, at least you will have handled some of the questions. But yes, it's commonly said uh, health is made at home and should only go to the hospital uh, for repairs. So uh, uh, thank you very much for just uh, uh, emphasizing that. Now, part of uh, the presentation uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Miriam just made focused on the fact that there's a lot of brain drain. So you say uh, we need the human resource to drive the infrastructure that uh, we're investing in in the sector. How do we attract those that have left Uganda for better opportunities to return and actually, you know, give the health sector that push, that boost, that professionalism, uh, that expertise that it needs? I, I don't, I will not pretend that I have answers to every, all aspects of that question. But I think we have opportunities here, opportunities uh, that we have probably missed before, uh, but which we can be looking at, particularly in how we organize the health system around a health workforce that is responsive to our communities and allocate our funding to drive that health uh, health healthcare network to respond to household needs. At present, uh, we are beginning to respond to what was introduced about 96, 97. We had a very big debate. Previous to that, health budget was allocated according to available infrastructure. So if there was a hospital in a town, in a village, it would get money. After the constitution, we took advantage of that. The constitution has certain provisions uh, where you can uh, restructure this. And allocations to health began to respond to people so that the health budget should be structured according to the population served. If that is adhered to and we begin to go that direction, we can get the local authorities to begin to allocate to people who drive the service. At present, the allocation is not like that. So for as long as you don't allocate sufficiently for those who deliver services, there will be a deficit even if they are available. Not that we have them in the numbers we would like, but even in the few numbers we have, we don't have this structured to ensure that we retain them. And therefore we shall have to go fundamentally go back on how we can see, look at a, cap, a per capita distribution that takes full account of available human resources to deliver and how those human resources can, uh, 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 can utilize available funding to look after a defined population okay. that will probably take, get many more, uh, absorb many more of the few people that we have that are skilled. Uh, we should also take opportunity of the existing instruments made here in Kampala. Kampala declaration was 1990, no, sorry, 1920, 20 something, 2008 or was it 2009? Some of you might remember. Uh, and out of this, we had the drive in 2010 mm -hmm to create the international, the, the, the WHO code of practice for international recruitment. This is a very good instrument because it can drive interaction 
bilaterally between source countries and donor countries, uh, sorry, uh, 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 recipient countries. So in this case, donor countries tend to be the poor countries and recipient countries are the rich countries who take these people, but they take them for free. There are ways you can structure this such they, that they don't only go, they actually come back. Mm. But because we do not have those agreements in place, a few countries have started. I know Ghana has started with Norway. Uh, Kenya recently started discussions with Namibia and Botswana uh, and so on. But generally in Uganda, if people want to go to Trinidad Tobago, you just make an agreement to send them. You have no idea whether they'll come back or they won't. We could actually begin to utilize existing instruments uh, to be able uh, to deal with this. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Kadama. And uh, to you and to all panelists, uh, there are some questions that are being sent in by our uh, by the attendees in the Q and A uh, tab at the bottom of your screen. Please visit that, and you can respond to some questions. Dr. Kadama, even before you leave, just uh, uh, visit that tab. Uh, I'd like to encourage all attendees. If you have a question for Dr. Kadama, he has probably another thirty minutes with us. Uh, use the Q and A uh, section for him to uh, probably elaborate more on some of the things he has raised. Again, Dr. Kadama, thank you very much. Uh, we need to move to uh, our next discussant, but before we do, I'd like to ask the technical team to put up our poll question. Those who are joining us on Twitter and on Facebook, uh, please, uh, the usual way that you uh, comment on Facebook and on Twitter, just do that. Remember to use the hashtags Castle Webinar and uh, Thrive Health uh, so that we're able to pick up your comment or your question. Our first poll question is, what is the key determinant for your choice of healthcare service delivery? What is the key determinant for your choice of healthcare service delivery? Is it personal or family budget, insurance company coverage, distance to the health facility, and finally, quality of service provided at the facility. Please pick the option that uh, applies to you, and then we will know uh, what your key determinant for choice of healthcare service is. At the moment, majority are saying uh, personal or family budget. Well, now we have uh, more people saying quality of service provided at the facility. I'll just allow a few more seconds uh, and then we will have the final tally. Our panelists, you can, uh, you're only observers uh, of this process. You cannot take the poll. All right, let's end the poll here. So 48% uh, of us are saying 46% of us are saying uh, what determines their choice of healthcare service delivery is the quality of service provided at the facility. Uh, the next option that was uh, uh, picked by 29% of us was personal or family budget. Thank you very much. I'd like now to move to our next discussant, uh, who is uh, Dr. Olive Kovosinje. She is a surgeon and an injury epidemiologist. She is a senior research fellow at Macquarie University School of Public Health, where she heads the trauma, injury, and uh, disability unit. She is a distinguished fellow of the George Institute for Global Health, University of New South Wales, Australia. She chairs the board of the Road Traffic Injury Research Network, an international agency working to improve road safety through research globally. She's also a member of the World Bank's Global Road Safety Facility Technical Advisory Group. She's a wife and mother of two young women. Dr. Olive has published more than 50 journal articles in scientific journals and written chapters in uh, professionally recognized books. Dr. Olive's recently published book, The Patient, discusses Uganda's health care system from the late 50s to present. I encourage you to find that book and read it. Uh, Dr. Olive Kovusinje, we're privileged to have you 
over to you. Uh, and please begin by, uh, you know, critique of what Dr. Uh, Miriam presented. Dr. Olive. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Um, and thank you, Castle, for the opportunity to um, participate in this webinar. Um, so, so the pandemic is actually one great opportunity and it's a pity that it has taken um, a pandemic to, to focus our attention on things that we should have been thinking about all along. Um, and, and while we were completely unprepared for the, for the pandemic, like the rest of the world, I think a question we have to ask now is, are we prepared, are we ready to learn the lessons that the pandemic uh, is forcing upon us? And I think unless we, we are ready and willing to learn those lessons, this opportunity could very easily go through our hands. We could actually squander the pandemic and, and not make appropriate, uh, learn the appro appropriate lessons. So uh, Miriam made um, a great presentation um, and uh, Dr. Kadama has uh, uh, highlighted quite a few things that uh, are related to that presentation. I'd like to pick on a, a few things. So um, rather than spend a minute or two critiquing the presentation and then moving on to something else that I'd like to say, um, I don't think there's anything that I would say outside of what Miriam has presented. So I'll just make comments on, on a number of things that uh, were highlighted in that presentation. The first one that I'll comment on is research. Um, and we have to say, what research? Uganda is actually quite well known for health research and institutions such as the one that I work at, Makere University, um, is highly rated based on the amount of research that comes out of this institution. But we have to ask ourselves, what kind of research, whose research agenda, who's funding this research? Uh, Miriam mentioned the fact that, of course, because of, you know, a lot of foreign funding, you know, maybe interests are not necessarily national interests. And I think the perfect example, even when we have the data here, some of it is, is, is actually routine data. For instance, injuries being the third leading cause, leading reason that Ugandans die in healthcare facilities. But because there's no foreigner, there's no global fund for for injury prevention or for managing injuries, then we don't have an injury prevention program. We don't have anything specific to injury, whether it's research or um, otherwise. So, so we all know what is said that he who pays the piper calls the tune. And unfortunately, this is very true in research. So a lot of the research that we are well known for is not necessarily driven by a Ugandan indigenous research agenda. And I think the pandemic has given us the opportunity to think about this and to say, well, so we, we are well known for research. What is our agenda? What is going to drive the kind of research that we undertake? And if we think this is important, are we putting our money where our mouths are or are we waiting for somebody else to come and fund what we believe to be the priority? So unfortunately in Uganda, we've excluded ourselves from most basic research. We actually do, we seem to think, you know, so during the pandemic, we all know there has been a lot of pressure, global pressure for there to be a vaccine. In Uganda, we seem to just be sitting, waiting for somebody else to find the vaccine so that we, they can come and test it on us. Think about that. So we've excluded ourselves from the possibility that we could be looking for a vaccine. I, in fact, we should just be consumers and not innovators. We should just be waiting for somebody else to do this. And what we do is complain that Europeans are going to use us as guinea pigs. But nobody has stopped Ugandans from developing a vaccine and going to test it in Italy and France. And so I, I know right now that sounds comical and, and ridiculous because indeed the kind of infrastructure, the kind of capacity that one needs to undertake vaccine research or pharmaceutical research of any nature takes decades to build. 
And we've not done that. We've been sitting on our laurels waiting for somebody else to undertake our research so that we can benefit from it. But the pandemic has showed us that no, you can't always get what you need from elsewhere. Sometimes those borders might close. Sometimes those countries have their own problems and they're worrying about their own people. They're not worrying about you. And so I think the pandemic has woken us up to the reality that we, we can't talk about building resilience if we are at the same time always dependent, always vulnerable. So I, I think we need to, you know, take advantage of this opportunity and begin to think, so if we're thinking 2040, if we're thinking that far ahead, so we've lost all of the decades behind, but let's not lose the decades beginning now in order to build a kind of capacity that we'll need in order to, to participate in the global um, pursuit for, for pharmaceuticals, for vaccines, and, and to, to not exclude ourselves from, from um, this type of research. Um, I'm talking of Vision 2040. Uh, Miriam's presentation again mentioned some of the things that we, we can anticipate there. Uh, I'd like to pick up on one, and that is the nutritional status. So, so of course, in Uganda, we have these scandalous statistics of malnutrition, you know, a third of our children below the age of five being stunted, and I think two thirds, Miriam knows this better, of um, pregnant mothers being anemic, you know, and, and all of these horrible statistics based on um, inappropriate, inadequate nutrition. So we seem to be failing to take advantage of one obvious partnership, and that is the partnership between health and education. Uh, Dr. Kadama uh, mentioned quite a bit about the fact that actually a lot of health is determined by other sectors. Um, so this is a key one. Now, if we were to have a functional uh, school health program, that school health, you know, so the two sectors coming together, this school health program would improve school attendance. It's known to improve school performance. It would reduce or eliminate extreme malnutrition in school, um, child, in, in children that are going to school. It would, it would increase markets for produce. It would generate jobs. A whole lot of good things would come out of a school health program that we have completely failed to, to, to take advantage of that is actually non-existent, uh, maybe exists only in paper. So, so looking at Vision 2040 and thinking about the nutrition of Ugandans, you know, we have these children, malnourished, hungry children that are trudging to schools that are unable to learn because their brains are not up to the task. And I think we need to, to to really think upon that because the human resource, again, Dr. Kadama mentioned this a few times, is critical. And if our human resource is malnourished and unable to learn, then we're setting ourselves up to fail. There's another point that Miriam raised, and that was the private, public private partnership. So I'm sure that there's some wonderful things have happened as a result of this PPP. Unfortunately, I think there are also a few things that have gone wrong, badly wrong. And I think right now, it's beginning to look as though PPP is actually a conduit for fraud because the private entity siphons money out of the public purse and that's where it ends. And, and this is not because the PPP itself is not a good thing, it's because we have an environment that has no, you know, that it doesn't encourage accountability and, and where fraud thrives and that the health sector has not been exempt. So I think, I don't know the whole story about the Loboa hospital, but I think it's still very fresh in our minds as an example of a PPP that right from conception can go wrong. Uh, and so I think it's one that we need to watch and be careful that when we say it's an opportunity, it is indeed an opportunity and it's not a setup um, for health resources to be lost. Uh, there was mention of a referral system and, and Miriam says that there are gaps in the referral system. I think that the more truthful statement is that there is no referral system really. There are gaps in a referral system. Uh, but this webinar is about looking at opportunities and making recommendations and, and trying to come up with, so what could we do differently 
given the experience of the pandemic and, and given the learnings that have come from the pandemic. So of course, there are many opportunities that have been identified. One obvious one being that we can be heard, that the health sector is being heard, is being listened to, everybody has their attention on this being a key sector, which is wonderful. Um, I think there's the potential, there's, so, so we now think, okay, we also have IT and IT is absolutely wonderful. We have webinars, we have Zoom, we have meetings and all this. And we have, you know, the social media that is, is um, helping with information dissemination. This is all good, this is wonderful. I think it's one we need to watch though because it has the potential to actually entrench and perpetuate inequality. And this is how. So when, when the pandemic started, it seemed to be that it was treating everyone the same way. It very quickly, uh, turned out to be a complete opposite, is that it actually entrenched certain vulnerabilities. And so when we send out information through social media, what we're doing is we're informing those that are already better off because they're the ones that have access to these technologies. And the risk is that the most vulnerable can actually drop through the cracks. And there were sections of the population that might have had access to, to technologies that as a result of the shrinkage of the economy and the hardships, more people are actually dropping off than joining these technologies. Um, especially in countries like Uganda where, you know, an OTT of 1,000, I think it's 1,400, can really make a big pocket, a big hole in one's pocket. So I think we need to be mindful that technology is wonderful it is driving growth, but it can also increase inequality. And we need to put in place mechanisms to ensure that the most vulnerable, including some health workers that really can't afford airtime all the time, that can't afford data, that those people don't fall through the cracks. Um, I mean, we've mentioned the opportunities to increase manufacturing, for instance, of, ma of PPEs generally. And I think this is to be, um, this is to be appreciated and not, and I think it's, you know, the point is because of poor accountability, we could very easily slide back into procurement now beginning to get stuff from China when all along during the lockdown, we were able to manufacture it ourselves. So I think, again, the emphasis being on, are we being truthful to what we say? Are we accountable? Is that system accountable? There's some recommendations there's a recommendation touching on um, the partner, uh, refocusing on partner engagement. And there was a statement that a significant part of our population makes their first treatment call to a private health facility. Yet the private health sector is not sufficiently engaged in the health delivery system. So this is puzzling to me because the private health uh, sector has been with us for a long time, probably as long as there has been a public one, there's been a private one. And so I'm not entirely sure what insufficient engagement we are referring to here, but I'd like to highlight something. And this mm -hmm. is that when people that are incapable, that are probably incapable of affording one wholesome meal a day, choose to go to a private clinic, that is very concerning. There must be a reason they're doing that. And the reason is that they're voting with their feet. It means that the public facilities have actually let people down, that people know they don't have anything there for them. And so they actually, families are selling family assets. They're selling land to afford a procedure in a private clinic. They're selling livestock to be able to see a specialist in a, in a private hospital. This is bad news for development generally. It is definitely bad news for health because those families are actually more vulnerable after such an encounter with the healthcare system, because now they have fewer resources to, to fall back on. The children are being malnourished because the mother had a cesarean section or the father had a hernia operation. This is ridiculous. I think what we need to do is to acknowledge that there is a role for the private um, health sector and clarify what that role is. All but right. instead of strengthening the, the hand of the private um, health sector against the public one, we actually need to bring more resources into the public sector so that it can serve those people that really shouldn't be affording private 
our health services. And there could be a whole lot, a whole longer discussion around how to finance our healthcare system. There are mm -hmm. people here on this forum that are much more capable of talking about that than I, but I think we need to look out for equity and to ensure that the way health, health is financed does not leave people more impoverished. Uh, we've been talking about catastrophic health expenditures, and I think the risk is there, that we think right. this partnership is going to help. Uh, Gabriel, okay. you're making sounds to say conclude. Yeah, yeah. so in yeah. conclusion, <laughs> in, in conclusion, I think actually what's most problematic with the health sector of course, other than the strangulating, you know, the strangulation due to lack of funding, what is most problematic is the governance issue. And I think this is where everything unravels, is that we've created a system that is very inequitable, that the people who manage and run this system have excluded themselves. They don't use this system. They have no incentive to improve the system. So I think that if a leader is taking public money to go to a foreign country for treatment, that leader has lost the moral authority to lead. Uh, so we are in a, so of course health is not, you know, it's in a context, it's in a context in a country where there are other governance issues. There are problems. We have a country that values, that prioritizes um, firearms ahead of lab equipment, that prioritizes soldiers ahead of scientists. So you, you don't have, so, and I think that the pandemic has taught us this, that we need to re completely rethink our idea of health security. That right. The country's enemies are not fought, fought by guns. And that we, if we don't do that, then we're increasing our vulnerability because the contagion, a contagion can actually be more powerful, more devastating, and certainly more elusive than guns. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Olive. I was waiting for you to say that prioritizes four-wheel drives ahead of ventilators, but you didn't That's go that direction. So I haven't, I haven't gone that direction <laughs> either. Uh, well, thank you very much, Dr. Olive. One of the things you uh, raised is, you know, we should understand what the role of the private uh, health providers should be. And uh, I think it's a perfect time for me to welcome and introduce Dr. Ian Clark. Dr. Ian Clark is the chairman of the Uganda Healthcare Federation, a member of the National Response to COVID-19 Committee. He's chairman of Clark Group, which includes Clark International University, Clark Junior School, and Clark Farm. And uh, he is active on several boards, including Windy, Mugahinga Conservation Trust, Clinic PESA, East Africa Healthcare Federation, Africa Healthcare Federation, Chiwoko Hospital and International Medical Group. He's also a columnist uh, with the Sunday Vision. He's the founder of Chiwoko Hospital, International Medical Centers, IAA Healthcare and International Hospital. He's written three books, The Man with the Key Has Gone. This is a very popular one. Uh, How deep is this pothole? and Smart Culture uh, Guide to Uganda. He's got one wife, three biological children, five grandchildren. His main interests are in development in the healthcare, education, and agribusiness sectors. He holds a medical degree, MB, BCH, at uh, Queen's University, Belfast, a diploma in tropical medi uh, medicine from Liverpool School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and a master's in public health, London School of Tropical Medicine. Dr. Ian Clark, you are welcome to uh, start on your discussion. Yeah, well, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for inviting me to be part of this. It's great to be here. Um, I, I want to uh, maybe just take up some of the points in terms of collaboration between the, the public and the private sectors. Um, as, as the speaker, Dr. Olive mentioned, you know, sometimes the public, the private sector is the, the uh, um, first place that the public will actually choose to go. And uh, what does that say about um, the, uh, the services that we get in either sector? Um, I think I've heard various figures in terms of the amount of money that's actually spent uh, and uh, it's about 45 to 50% of people will, will be treated in the private sector. And, but 
costly, uh, about 70%. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of out-of-pocket expenses as well, even within the public sector. Um, I find that the, although there's talk about public-private collaborations, I, I find that in fact, uh, there's quite a bit of competition really between the public and the private sectors. Um, we had a long time ago in the early 90s, we started uh, a fund, I think PHC fund, and, and through that fund there was uh, part of the budget of the faith-based hospitals was government. This was a recognition of the fact that the faith-based hospitals were actually meeting a lot of the need. Um, and, um, for the years, that budget has never increased and it has shrunk from, I think if I remember well, in Chogo Hospital, it was probably maybe at least 10% of our expenses. It's now shrunk to 1% or less. So, there, so although the principle was there, it hasn't been followed up in terms of the support, saying that these hospitals are actually meeting, meeting an essential public need. And I think it's been disappointing some government policy which is actually uh, been competing, particularly with the faith-based sector, which is actually often, uh, there are about 60 faith-based hospitals, often in uh, hard to reach parts of the, of the, of the nation and, and often really struggling for funds. And when you see sometimes then infrastructure is being put inside um, faith-based hospitals, it's, it's disappointing. So one, one uh, that, I feel like that isn't, um, there's talk about there's a good relation in terms of public-private uh, collaborations. I wonder if the action is really worth it. The, uh, <clears throat> I've been part of the this national response to COVID fundraising committee, and uh, sorry about the pickups, <laughs> which we're still we're still trying to uh, to to purchase actually at the best price. Um, but they, in fact, the public uh, system hardly allows us. The money's still in the bank. Um, the, I did find it a bit disappointing that the attitude of the minister when it came to PPs and so on was that we need all that we can get uh, for ourselves and even the people in the faith-based sector, they had sources of money somehow that they would, uh, they would be able to buy their own. And then I also find that there is a certain finger point in play. And most recently, um, some private labs have started to do COVID testing. Uh, including the Lancet and a couple of others. And the minister has complained about the, the high cost of these tests that are being offered in the private sector. But I know the cost of the tests and the, the P PCR tests are not cheap to begin with. But I feel like if you were to do a cost benefit analysis in terms of the amount of money that the public sector is paying out in allowances for people to do these tests, you find that the private sector would be able to uh, because uh, the, the, the allowances paying out at the present time are massive that the Ministry of Health is paying out to the people involved in doing these tests and obviously in contact and so on. So uh, sometimes there's a bit of a double standard there. Um, one of the issues which was raised by, I think it was uh, all of us, is the influence of politics in the health sector. Politics in the health sector comes from uh, outside. Uh, there's a lot of influence from State House. Uh, and uh, then it comes from the politics within the sector itself, uh, because there's a lot of politics. Um, and uh, I think we've seen the influence of politics from State House in the uh, reaction of the president to the National Health Insurance uh, Scheme, to propose, which he is very about. Um, and uh, so I'm not sure how that will go forward since the president's against it. And also we've seen again, as was alluded to by, by Olaf, <clears throat> in this so-called international specialist hospital, where an amount of $370 million, I think, was approved by parliament for the government to borrow to, to, to do this hospital. And these are sums that no private sector person has ever dreamed of. Uh, I mean, I can tell you that the most expensive uh, hospital in Uganda, this international specialist hospital, is probably no more valuation than $20 million at most. And most are in the value of $7 million. So it's a huge, huge interesting gap there. Um, so the, 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 the politics, and I think most recently, uh, you know, the fact that the minister has actually gone into elected politics herself, really, you're just looking at the minister here who's a professional who was guiding as well, I think, through COVID. And now she's, she's gone into politics itself. I wonder why that is. Now, in terms of the, the um, 
uh, the, the, the public sector, I think we would, many of us would agree that the sector has done good vertical programs. Their HIV, uh, the access to drugs, um, you know, I think excellent. Uh, I think uh, vaccination programs, uh, mosquito distribution, uh, among others. But I wonder why, why family planning is not a big vertical program because, you know, any population rises in my time from being here from under into 43 million. And we are expected to have the resources to deal with that while we cut the health budget. I wonder how that works in terms of economics. It's, uh, it's, it's quite an interesting uh, Kind of quite an interesting way to go as we create more districts, all of which are supposed to have more health centers with the, with, the, with the less budget. So, you know, it has a lot of sympathy with the public sector in terms of the way that politics drives this uh, increase, uh, what would be a necessary increase in resources, and yet the resources are simply not there. Um, and that's why I say with family planning, uh, um, should we not? be leadership and guidance in terms of having the numbers of children that we can deal with uh, in terms of these ser public services such as education and health services. Because after all, we want to produce we're, uh, we're our, our, our young population, but we, we do want a population that is educated and fit for the 21st century and not a population that is really only doing farm labouring on my farm. Um, uh, I think... Um, uh, I want to also mention. Uh, I've mentioned the, the districts. Yeah, on the on the on the aspect of training. I I I, ha um, I have a training institution, uh, and we train nurses, we train health workers, we train public health uh, people, we train um, uh, people in in the health sector. Uh, it's interesting with the councils, and I think I, I have to highlight the nursing council uh, and some education council, but, but sometimes the councils seem to be, instead of building up our human resource, instead of taking the attitude that, that we, you know, we need to take our people and we need to, you know, push them forward and, and, and really affirm them, it almost seems to be a destructive and retrograde, retrograde attitude by some of the councils. And I would like to see so the councils be a lot more develop, developmental and forward looking in their approach. I mean, we are not in the 19th century any longer, we're in the 21st century in terms of approaches to education and how we can really make the best of our human resource and affirm our young people and affirm our health workers, not just all the time continually tell them, oh, you need to do another year, you don't have this qualification, you know, all, all this very negative stuff. And, then, and there's another point in terms of this public-private sector relationship. I think that it's interesting to me that the public sector seems to want to be the private sector because we have, uh, you know, we have the, um, the new women's hospital, which uh, the charges were set such that the very good. Um, we have the Institute, which charges for its uh, um, services. Although, you know, the director will definitely say that there's a lot of forgiveness in terms of people who can't pay, but that's fair enough. I mean, Cardiac Institute, which also charges. And then we also have, um, uh, associated with the Cancer Institute, the radiotherapy units, which is also charged. Now, it's interesting to me that all of these institutes as well uh, uh, lobbied and got a public vote that they, they have their costs actually, their salaries and so on, that government, but they want to be private as well and add on charges to that. And I'm, I'm kind of interested as to what the rationale is behind that. Um, also, I would question from the first uh, uh, sorry, from uh, uh, Dr. Murray's presentation, this 455 billion that's above the country, who has verified that? That's over $100 million that was apparently spent by, on public sector. I think this was a, um, I don't know where, where the backup of this is. Uh, now, I would like to go on and be a bit more positive. Uh, the, um, I think that the opportunities, as far as the um, sector is concerned, a lot of it would involve really being able to shift to use the technologies available. Um, I, there are a number of apps that have been developed um, uh, that would make it more accessible for us to do task shifting, to use algorithms and to bring the service closer to the people without the cost of having to take expensive four wheel drives, uh, highly qualified surgeons and so on, rural areas, but we these apps. Um, apps for payment, because we find that when there are apps for payment of small amounts of money for services that they could use for 
example, has been great in the solar industry, and also um, uh, you know the, the paying for data and so on. And so, forth. but I there's one uh, organization I know a small uh, startup getting going called Clinic Pesa, which is making it possible for people to pay for their clinic costs through this app. It's, it's not, it hasn't really been launched widely yet, but they're working in collaboration with MTN and with one of the banks. And, and the nice thing about this is if somebody doesn't use their money, then uh, it, it will accrue interest and, and they'll be able to use it for savings as well. There's another organization called, called Streamline, which is doing a lot of the, the medical records data systems. I think they've been working with Cassisi Hospital and some of the mission hospitals and their price point is very appropriate. And there's developed by Ugandans, very good. Also ties in with the uh, data collection for the Ministry, ministry of Health. And there's organizations that are doing telehealth and, and telehealth. Can't remember just the name of them all, but every clinic group has probably got an opportunity to have also a virtual clinic, where they can actually do virtual consultations, and then they can they can send out the medication or send out. Yes. There's an organization in Kenya called Maidawa that is uh, traced from source uh, the pharmaceutical manufacturers in customers' hands. Um, and then, of course, we know of smart uh, technologies here, which does the um, uh, tracking and um, verification uh, for medical companies. Now, another opportunity that exists is, of course, in e-learning. With we the um, institutions have we shift, you know, where the, the, our, our universities are closed. But but if we can use this as an opportunity to develop good platforms for distance learning, then this will carry on into the future because distance learning just doesn't apply to lockdowns. So I think that's an opportunity for 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 us in terms of training and institutional learning. And right. I know for a fact, uh, I should finish it. Uh, yes, uh, two minutes. Uh, two minutes. I know for a fact that the pharmaceutical manufacturers quality chemicals is really happening very very well because since lockdown because they were able to take advantage of the lack of supply from India and they're supplying a lot of the southern African countries and I know NITL is doing well in making PPEs so these are opportunities you know from the health sector for people to uh, to benefit so yes with that I'll just close I just think that sometimes there is there are words spoken uh, in terms of uh, how we're all uh, collaborating together, but in, in fact, underlying that there's quite a lot of competition between the public and the private sectors, and even competition against the, the, the faith-based and the non-profits, which I think is disappointing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ian Clark, for those insights. And uh, you raise a number of questions. And uh, when I invite our special guest, I am sure he will respond to uh, some or even many or all of those participants we have to move on but are those on social media please uh, use the hashtags that we shared earlier on uh, castle webinar and thrive health so that we're able to pick up your questions those who are joining us via zoom uh, continue to use the q and a tab our panelists are visiting that tab and responding to your question so let me just have your question your comment there our panelists will respond but also our technical team will take a record of what is going on in the Q&A tab. Let me call for our next poll question, and then I will introduce our next discussant. Let's have the poll question. Our poll question, our second poll question is, in your opinion, what should priority areas in the development of the health sector. I beg your pardon. In your opinion, what should priority areas in the development of the health sector in Uganda be? In your opinion, what should priority areas in the development of the health sector in Uganda be? Should it be infrastructural development, infectious disease treatment and research, human resource training and remuneration, and uh, finally, immunization and supply chain. We'll just give a few seconds for that. In your opinion, what should priority areas in the development of the health sector in Uganda be? Should it be infrastructure development, infectious disease treatment and research, human resource training and remuneration, or immunization and supply chain? A 
Okay, if you could take the vote and uh, take the poll. Uh, we also have this on uh, Twitter. So if you're joining us via Twitter, uh, the poll question will be posted and please uh, take your pick. So we have 67% of us saying human resource training and remuneration should be the priority area. Well, thank you very much. We will have uh, our next poll question uh, at about 11 a.m. I'd like now to invite our next discussion, Dr. Richard Idro. He's the current president of the Uganda Medical Association. He's also a consultant pediatrician and pediatric neurologist at Mulago Hospital and a senior lecturer at Makerere University. He's also an executive board member of the International Child Neurology Association and a board member of the International League Against Epilepsy. He is a leading clinical research scientist and leads a pediatric neuroscience research group at Makerere. His research focuses on the understanding of brain injury and uh, sequel of brain infections in children and interventions to improve the outcomes. He coordinates graduate training in pediatrics at Makerere University. These studies produced over 100 publications, 20 invited uh, scientific presentations at international conferences and 10 international awards, some of which include 2015 African Research Leadership Award by Medical Research Council UK and the inaugural 2019 Greenwood African Award for leading studies uh, to understand the nodding syndrome and the effects of malaria on the brain. He was part of the World Health Organization Committee that developed Sorry, my screen just uh, disappeared. Uh, but I was saying he was uh, part uh, of the World Health Organization Committee that developed the uh, severe malaria management guidelines. He is an alumnus of the Institute of National Transformation, INT. He holds a PhD in clinical neuroscience from University of Amsterdam and uh, pediatric neurology with the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health at the Great Ormond Street Hospital in London. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Richard Idro. Over to you, doctor. Um, good morning, Gabriel, and uh, good morning, um, uh, listeners and those on the different social media. Um, I bring you all greetings from Uganda Medical Association, the flagship association of doctors in, in the country. Um, UMA's vision is quality health and quality health services um, for the population, but uh, we aim, our mission is um, the professionalism and welfare of uh, doctors in the, in, in the country. Um, I'd like to thank Miriam for an extensive presentation, um, which really covered a wide area of, um, of to, to, speak, to speak of, of opportunities um, in relation to COVID and what, as a country, what we can do, we can do better. And uh, I'll just focus on uh, a few, uh, just a few quite well laid out and brings out quite a number of um, very important areas. If, if taken carefully, we, we can do much better in, um, in the health services of this country. And I'll say we, we actually have it all. It is just a matter of organization and uh, we can do much better than what we are doing. Um, currently, um, Uganda produces uh, 500 doctors uh, annually and we are producing 150 specialists. And um, if I may repeat it, Uganda is producing over 500 doctors currently um, and over 150 specialists. We have uh, 16 regional referral hospitals. In effect, we can send 10 new specialists to each regional referral hospital every year now. So there is absolutely no reason that we cannot have enough specialists, we cannot have enough doctors to cover the country. We have uh, about just over 2,000 sub-counties. So if you were to think about it, within four years, 
the country can produce enough doctors to have a doctor in each and every sub-county sub in this country. That is the point which um, I am trying to drive at. We have the human resources, if well deployed, will be sufficient to improve a number of things in this country. And it is just a matter of planning and rethinking of how we can do this, uh, this better. The second area is uh, thinking about um, the infrastructure and again, rela relating it to the human resource. So all of the things coming from the medical association, I'm bringing it back to the human resource, but relaying the infrastructure, the referral system and the implementation of the different health services and bringing it back to the human, res uh, human resources. Um, right now, um, as uh, Miriam presented, our health system, um, the treatment, the curative services are such that you have the health center too um, for um, at, at a Paris level for 5,000 people, the health center three for 20 to 25,000 people at a sub-county. And then we have the health center four for the constituency or the county, and then the general, hos uh, the general hospital and the referral uh, regional referral hospitals, and then the regional referral hospitals. But if you think about it, um, north of Karuma, first of all, over 70% of the doctors are in Kampala metropolitan area. So in Kampala, Wakiso, Mukono, almost the majority of the doctors in this country are in this area. And uh, most of the imaging uh, the diagnostics are also again in within within this area. Yet, as we saw from the outbreak of the epidemic, um, COVID spared no region. In any case, it was a lot more in the border areas of uh, Elegu, Gulu, uh, Tororo, Busia, Malaba, um, Mutukula area, Chotera, Masaka, and then a bit around Kabale, and now um, the outbreak is starting around the uh, Kampala region. So the distribution of the resources does not match um, the population dynamics in this, in this country. And if you think about imaging, north of Karuma, there is not a single CT scan to do imaging. So where people have road traffic accidents, and they need to be imaged to whether they have sustained um, uh, skull fractures, whether they have sustained brain injuries. There is not a single imaging modality in any hospital north of this place. In Lira Regional Referral Hospital, we have just two specialists. We have only two specialists in Moroto. Actually, both of them are ophthalmologists. We have only nine doctors in Narua Regional Referral Hospital, a regional referral hospital which serves for more than 3.5 million people in West Nile. So we, uh, there is this mismatch of uh, resources. And uh, what we are thinking is this, we have an opportunity now to try to rethink many of what we are doing. Yet as was presented, um, we are having we are spending over four, in 2016, we spent over 400 billion uh, ceilings, just uh, resources being sent to India, to Kenya and South Africa alone of people going for treatment in this region. But as the COVID-19 epidemic has demonstrated when the planes stopped fighting, these people, we have been able to cater for these people within the country. The same health workers who are in this country have really managed this COVID epidemic very well. And information coming from the Heart Institute indicate that less than a quarter of those who go out of the country actually need to go with what we have available. And if you think that the women's hospital was built for just about $34 million, which come to about 125 billion um, ceilings, the amount of money, the four, over 400 billion, which just went to India, Kenya, and South Africa alone, could have built three of such resources, like three of such hospitals in, in Uganda. Now we have approved about seven cities. And if we were to think that each of these cities should have a hospital of that nature, 
equipped to that nature in say Mbarara, in Fort Portal, in, um, in Jinja, in Mbale, in Gulu, and in Arua, then, and Lira, the new hospitals, and then Masaka. It will just take about two years if we stopped these referrals, that each of these hospitals will, uh, each of these cities will have a hospital of the nature of the maternal and newborn hospital in this country. And that is what as the Uganda Medical Association we are promoting. We are saying, let us stop these referrals. Let us stop uh, sending people unnecessarily to, us, uh, to these countries outside. And we use these resources to build the infrastructure within the country. Let us develop our own uh, infrastructure. Um, a few years ago, government did send quite a number of doctors for advanced training, especially in India. And many of these people have come back um, uh, to be, and they're able to do laparoscopic surgeries, or, uh, really very delicate surgeries. But unfortunately, we have not equipped our hospitals to the effect that they can utilize these skills. They are now currently underemployed and uh, unable to, to use. I was introduced as a, um, as a pediatric neurologist training in one of the premier hospitals in the UK. There's extensive things which I, I personally uh, can, can do, but the resources are really quite limited that we cannot apply some of our training but we are there in this in this country the human resources are available and we can build on it and we dimension that we're producing 150 specialists we can do more the as uganda medical association we did make some recommendations to government and one of which was that um it's time to start taking some of the baby steps um a lot of the discussion has focused on, um, on ICUs, but we said even before we go to the ICUs, have we created high dependency units in our hospitals? That the, a high dependency unit, a four bed high dependency unit is actually the cost of a pickup. So if we thought about a high dependency unit in each general hospital for adults, and then another one for children, just four beds, using the spaces in the hospital which are already available, training the nurses who are available in those hospitals to take charge of this. We will have eight bed high dependency units which deliver oxygen. We have already demonstrated, the Ministry of Health has demonstrated that uh, having oxygen plants, say in Molago, and then now a few of the regional referral hospitals is possible so that each of these bigger hospitals, we have the big oxygen plants. And then in the smaller hospitals, we build smaller uh, oxygen plants and then attach these high dependency units. This will take a long way. And even beyond COVID, all the stroke uh, patients who get stroke, patients who get heart attacks, patients who get severe um, injuries from road traffic accidents, they will have a space where they can be cared for. This is our advocacy plan. Let's start with the right. baby, uh, baby steps. Um, the, the next one is improving the referral system so that um, patients who are at the different levels go on. Now, we are proposing a change. A long time ago, um, we, the health center threes and up to now are currently being led by the clinical officers but Uganda is now producing enough doctors to be able to run the health center force. So uh, the health center three, sorry, health I'm going to the three, health yes. center threes. Yes, yep. the health center threes. We're producing enough doctors to have a doctor in each sub-county. Already the government programs have an agricultural extension officer uh, from the production unit. So an agricultural officer and a vet at, at the level of the sub-county. Why can't we have a doctor running the health center threes? Mm. A person with a family medicine um, so that we have a higher level care delivered at the health center three. And then we increase the number of doctors in the health center four. Currently, there are a maximum of two. This, uh, the senior medical officer who is in charge who does administration and then one other doctor, which means right. that the theaters 
can only run uh, for for only some some period and then at the general referral the general the dis district hospitals we start having specialists so that the regional referral hospitals do what they are supposed to do there is no reason why a person with a brain injury should be referred from barara to come to mulago because mbarara should be able to run neurosurgery services so that the regional referral hospitals can now have neurologists they can have brain surgeons and these things can be done at that level we are producing this human resource that we need to start reorganizing this and just 2000 sub counties those are just only 2000 doctors and we have so many doctors for example the last group who were produced last year many of them have not been taken up we are in september we are releasing another uh, 500 having completed internship they can fill half the sub counties just these two years with uh, with with uh, with doctors lastly um i thought we could look at our uh, opportunities in training and uh, this is again utilizing what we have and here my focus is on pharmacy training if we think about it and it is something which we have been reflecting on recently and we'll be engaging our pharmacy colleagues in this uh, many of the pharmacists to join pharmacy school, it is only the brightest Ugandan children, adolescents and young adults who join. The ones who score triple A's, two A's and one B, really very bright individuals who go to pharmacy school in this country. We train them for four years. And when they finish, many of them then go and work either as drug representatives or they work in the pharmacists. But we have dispensers whom we are training who can deliver many of these medicines in the pharmacies. We are allowing our pharmacists to work like traders when these are really bright individuals who should be thinking about how to transform our hubs into new medicines. And I think this is one of the biggest opportunities which we are missing as a country. All right. If we could think through and go through the pharmacy curriculum, whether increasing even if it means making it five years and they get um, a doctor of pharmacy degrees, so that they go into production, thinking about the products which we have in this country. We have the national, the uh, chemotherapeutic and botanical unit in uh, Wandegar. Of all the hubs which we have, what have we so far produced? What new medicine have we produced? COVID has shown us that we can transform many things. We are now making uh, face shields here, we are making masks here, we are making sanitizers here. But all these hubs which our parents and grandparents have, have used. During the wars I grew up, used, uh, we used lots of hubs to treat us. All our malaria, I mean, when we are in displaced camps, we are using those things. But we need to now transform them. And the people who can do this are our pharmacists. We need to rethink their training and we refocus them to start going into this um, rather than uh, going into uh, peddling what is already made so that we utilize as a country what, um, what, what, we, what we have. I would like to stop, uh, stop here, but I, in, a, in, a, in a nutshell, I was just thinking that we have a, the human resource, we can only improve it. We need to re-strategize and think about the health delivery systems it is time that as we go even into the into the campaigns each of the political parties to rethink the health sector in the vision 20, uh, 2040 can we now start getting highly trained individuals to start going down to the sub county uh, sub county level rethink the regional referral hospital that we have the specialized um, individuals there and those with med um, uh, that is the masters of medicine the surgeons pediatricians in, uh, go to the, to the general hospitals at the level of the district. And we rethink the training of, the, of our pharmacists and redo the infrastructure to, to comment with this. That the All public right. service starts thinking about the, the human health resources, the structure should match the population growth. We are now 40 million, yet the human resources structure was when we were 20, 30 million. Uh, that we need to rethink the structure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Idro. Uh, 
of course, there are many things that I would like to pick up on, not only from you, but from all our panelists. But because we don't have uh, that much time, let us use the Q&A uh, to put these questions to the panelists. And our panelists are doing a good job at actually visiting that tab and responding to your questions. It's now a great honor for me to uh, invite and introduce our chief, uh, our chief guest, our special guest for today's webinar. He is Dr. Charles Olaro. He is the Director, Health Services, Curative Services at the Ministry of Health, Uganda. He's a senior consultant uh, surgeon and has served as Director of Fort Porter Regional Referral Hospital for three years, having initially served as Medical Superintendent of the same hospital. He played an excellent role in developing Fort Porter Regional Referral Hospital promoting sanitation and hygiene. Uh, he curbed staff absenteeism and relationship with leaders. He still, for some reason, my uh, notes keep vanishing, uh, but uh, I beg your pardon there. Uh, yes, he still uh, services in this capacity uh, in addition to heading the hospital. Prior to this, he served in government as a medical superintendent and consultant surgeon at Arua Regional Referral Hospital for seven years. He holds a medical degree and a master's degree in surgery from Makere University and a master's degree in health services management and a master's in uh, business administration from ESAMI. Our special guest for today, uh, Dr. Charles Olaro, you are welcome uh, to make your comments. Over to you, doctor. And Dr. Olive is clapping for you, if you did not see. Well, thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, the fellow panelists. Uh, and thank you, Castle Think Tank, for inviting me to join and participate in, in this discussion, which is really endearing to, to me, because I have since moved through service delivery ladder up to now where I am. First, I want to appreciate and recognize my, my colleague, Olive, because this is one of the areas we've been discussing. Initially, I definitely thought we would be able to, I will limit my comments to the impact of COVID to real the service delivery, but I look at definitely all the health system strengthening areas. has placed on the health system. And as much as the Ugandan health system has improved over mm -hmm. a number of few years, this, it is still vulnerable to external shocks. As all of you are aware that even the best health systems in the world have had yes, which the pandemic has, has put, put to them. But particularly for Uganda, in the event that we have sustained community transmission, they grow, there will be growing demand on the health facilities, and this likely will affect the delivery of routine services, which will include antenatal, immunization, management of HA, malaria, pneumonia, tuberculosis, severe acute malnutrition, and other essential services. So the ministry is organizing that response to COVID. But at the same time, we are that we have to focus on maintaining essential services. You are all aware that before we had a COVID test, we required a number of people who died because of other and cause the challenges. So what should we focus on in looking to essential services is because we want to limit the risk and morbidity and mortality from those diseases which are indicated, but also to maintain a healthy and productive population and to reduce the likelihood of outbreaks of vaccine preventable diseases, including measles and others. But overall, we want to limit the long-term impact of COVID pandemic on the overall system so that 
the gains which we have had over the previous years are not are not lost. So, what did we do as a means to respond to this effect? The means they have these coordination structures at national, regional, Doctor, and district level. Doctor, yes. I apologize for interrupting. Uh, there seems to be interference. I just need to make sure uh, that it's not only mine. Uh, so, yes. Uh, could you just hold, no, when you sit, just sit back a bit. Just, yes, if you could stay in that position, let's see if it works better. So I'm very sorry I for was, interrupting. Thank you, Gabriel. Because I wouldn't want to communicate to myself alone. I really want to share this message. So the ministry establishes structures at national, regional, and district level. Representation from all members across across board, including the private sector. And the ministry developed and disseminated guidance to districts. And this time I want to emphasize that normal guidelines and protocols normally take time to develop. But this time we are able to develop them in real real time. Within one week we are able to get in the movie. One, uh, you can make associations because they are quite confused. They have been with us in this journey. And we really appreciate leadership for Ghana made associations. We also said to you that must continue to impact on the overall morbidity and mortality in Uganda. And think that we shared all this with the districts. And we had to work with the partners and see that we are, COVID is going to be with us for a long time. We have to bring in back the services. So that you see that we have to handle industrial spray. And we are distributing most things. Despite COVID being there, malaria is more than any other disease. We purposely designated treatment units and general referral skills to ensure that the law has facilities, including private facilities and private not for profit, were left to offer services. This was deliberate, not that we, we didn't want to engage the private sector or engage the private not for profit. Looking at from experience from other countries, if you Take care of COVID in all facilities it means that you will seed it all facilities and you will put all the health, the risk, the, the health work at, at, at risk. So we dedicated health facilities. We also dedicated special teams to oversee the continuity of essential services. And we even recruit, rec recruited additional, additional staff. So we decentralized the response to the districts. And as I indicated, we put in the gui guidelines. I want to take just a snapshot to, sh to share what are the impacts because we have been monitoring the the services and we see we saw that TB and malaria services seem to be uninterrupted during the lockdown. The number of malaria cases actually even increased by 56 percent between January and April. Antinental decreased by 7% over the same period of time. But the most affected regions were in the northern and southwestern regions. The health deliveries reduced by 10%. And the most hit was immunization. Because we are aware that 40% of our outputs in immunizations are contributed through outreaches. So when outreaches stopped, then this was affected. So going back to the subject of the day that what are these, the opportunities which you have seen out of COVID? First, definitely that it provided an opportunity to recruit additional staff, epidemiologists, medical officers, specialists, critical care nurses, ambulances, drivers, anesthesiologists, and laboratory and to the regions because we didn't want to remove the staff from offering other services and be able to do that. 
we are equipping all regional hospitals. And as you are aware already, we have completed Jinja and Lacho. We have procured oxygen. Dr. Idro mentioned about oxygen is one of the key components. We are procuring a new plant for Mulago, which is able to produce 1,200 1, liters of oxygen per hour. One also will be in Entebbe and Bombo Hospital. In terms of referral, as I want again by what he indicated, we make baby steps. We are procuring such A type B ambulances, free type C, but free bot ambulances, and also we are procuring two type C negative pressure ambulances. And then we are procuring and through Red Cross 10 ambulances, which will be put in. On the highways, so that will be that's for the last financial year, and then we will procure additional ones, so that almost all the over two hundred and twenty black spots in this country will be having an ambulance will be serviced by an ambulance. We are also going to train four hundred nurse nurses in critical care. This is Barara University is partnering with us in this area. And then we are going to strengthen the border health. As you know, one of the, where we had the truck drivers definitely was from the border health. It's one of the areas which we are going to strengthen. In terms of technology, which has been mentioned, we are definitely going to embrace ICT solutions. We are not going to go to the same way where we are having several meetings. I think most of the training and first building will not be delivered through through ICC, apart from those which will be face face sessions. We have had multi-sectoral collaborations with the military, the different ministries, and also we have scaled up testing to the private laboratories. However, there are always challenges. One of them is that we are having this pandemic amidst several epidemics. As a country, we had the yellow fever epidem I mean, epidemic, we had in the West Nile, we had EVD, we had measles, and recently we have also had Rift Valley fever in the Kabale region. There also have been global shortages. Even if you wanted to test, test kits, you won't be able to access them. PPEs. Infodynamic, there's a lot of misinformation. And then definitely also we have a mobile population, which now with the opening, the risk is even increased. There have been mental health challenges. All of you have lived in Uganda. You have not had people setting up themselves or alighting themselves with using petrol. This is now a new phenomenon, which is bringing in a new dynamics because of COVID. We have different laxity of population. And then there the are financing gaps. And all of you are aware of that there has been an increase in teenage pregnancies due to closed schools and a lot of gender-based violence. But all in all, the ideas which have been highlighted by my colleagues, Dr. Idro, Miriam, and Olive, Ian Clark and Kadama are pertinent. But all those are in the Ministry of Health plan. It's just that if we get in adequate financing, insurance is still there. And we think village health teams as community, I mean the community health workers, extension workers is still in our plan. So I think we just need to be able to see that mm. what can we be able to do in the next coming five years, and progressively, this we can be able to, to rule. Make a last comment on what Idro, I think Idro, it will be first that we functionalize the health center force, 
which I'll ask you aware of that a number of them are not functioning to the required and the higher levels because before we start thinking of deploying doctors at health center, health center free. So that health center free still remain as primary health care facilities. So Chair, I want to end by saying that in this phase of increasing COVID-19 community transmission and particularly from, from unknown transmission lines, it's up to us and every one of us to protect themselves and follow the, pro, the preventive guidelines. All right. If we don't do it and COVID overwhelms us, it will definitely put a very big strain on the health, on the health systems. And even the few gains which we have will completely be vanished. I think I would want to end their chair, unless there are Thank questions. You. Thank you very much, Dr. Olaro. Yes, there are questions, uh, a number of them. And uh, uh, all attendees, please use the Q&A because now we're going to be uh, mainly focusing on the questions that you are asking. Uh, but uh, Dr. Olaro, the ministry and the sector in general has had has come up with very many plans. Some are short-term, mid and long-term plans. COVID-19 has required that some of the things we had in our long-term planning should be brought forward. And uh, some have been highlighted during uh, this webinar. Uh, what are some of those things that are being brought forward? Because uh, the panelists did highlight some, but it seems like the Ministry of Health is sticking to where these things were. Uh, in the plans to uh, three, four, five years. Okay, so thank you. As, as, as I have, have, have highlighted that COVID actually is an opportunity to health, the health, has been an opportunity to the health sector. Yes, it has been a challenge, but it's also an opportunity for us to be able to strengthen our health, health systems. So, I have indicated that we've, we have, during the surge, we've recruited additional staff. And specifically, in the first phase, we recruited 210 health workers. And in the second phase, we recruited 227, 28 health workers. And we are training. So, and now we are able to train using virtual mm. systems which means that we, we, instead of you being able to train only about 10 people, you can actually reach the whole country in a short one. Okay. We're equipping the, the ICUs. So, and we, we are put, these are going to be permanent structures. They are not going to be like a short term. These are really going to be, yes, they will address the short term challenges, but they are long term investments. Investment in public health, like the border points of entry, this is really a long term in, investment doctor if so, i may doctor if i may on the equipping and then the, what, yes. if i may on the equipping the uh, icus this we've been hearing for over two months now uh it seems like the progress is going a little too slow and yet uh this pandemic may not give us the opportunity to you know keep going at that pace because uh the story of 10 icu beds per region has gone on and on and on. Where are we at with how many ICU beds have we actually managed to equip in this period? Gabriel, we are securing 145 additional ICU beds, which have indicated Mbale, Lacho, and Jinja have already been completed. The teams are in Western Uganda, they are going to massacre. Kabale and Mbarara. And then, before, then they move. We expect that in the next, by the end of next month, we would have completed install because it, it is going together with the training because it's not, this is new equipment. And they are, as Idro indicated, we do not have people who are trained. So it is going together with the training. So, so it will be concluded in the next one to two months and all the facilities will have. Okay, all right. Then if I may just ask something that uh, Dr. Ian Clark put to you uh, of uh, 
government seeming to compete uh, or wanting to be, uh, you know, a private health provider. Uh, you know, the new hospitals that are being put up require that people will pay money. And yet, uh, you know, we're calling these public hospitals. Um, Gabriel, first, when, when we abolished USA fees in, in, in 2001, there was a, a provision that from a general hospital, they will have a grade A for those who would want to do one to pay. So appropriation in aid is one of those areas where we do one. So I don't think government is going into one. But also, as you are aware of that, as we are transitioning to transitioning to health insurance, you, you really want to put in systems where people can be able to do one access and they can be able to, to pay. So this is one of the roadmaps to, towards issues of health insurance. So government has provided facilities because if you look like in Kampala, there is Kawempe. So, and then we also we're discussing with the cases here to see how we can upgrade all the health center fees and provide them with the theaters like Kisenyi upgraded to city hospitals, because now we're discussing what, what do we call these facilities? Instead of calling them as health center force, we shall call them city hospitals. So we are providing for all layers of, of the population where they can be able to access services. Then those who have some little money, they can be able to go to the women hospital. So this is not really in a, in a, in a competition at all. All no, right. Uh, probably Dr. Ian Clark will have uh, something to say on that. But Dr. Olaro, thank you very much. Please visit the Q&A. There are some questions there for you. Uh, Dr. Ian Clark, there is a question, and I know you've typed an answer to it, the one from Flavia uh, Nasaka. It said, she says, I would like to hear from Dr. Ian Clark on whether private health providers have engaged the Ministry of Health on what role they can play in care. So, uh, so far, all the 12 deaths first went to private facilities before they were transferred uh, to the treatment facilities. And I have seen your question. However, this is also something I put to the Ministry of Health on Thursday when I did do a radio show with them. And I, I believe what we're trying to understand here is if the fatalities that we've had where people have died, if they actually came, they, I think all of them or most of them came from a private health facility fast. So the question is, beyond the detecting, because it seems like the detecting seems to be coming late, beyond the detecting, how are the private health facilities working with Ministry of Health so that, uh, you know, uh, even when these people come, there's already care that has taken place, so that uh, mm -hmm. they're not being referred at a point where it's arrived, because in some cases we've seen they arrive and soon after they're dead. So thanks. Uh, I think the issue is in terms of kind of a, a directive that's been given by the Ministry of Health, which is that uh, you know all the COVID cases should be treated in or, or an integrated B uh, or some government hospitals. So when a case arrives, and I know there was a case went to IHK and was being treated in ICU uh, as a suspected COVID, and then when that case was uh, confirmed then it was transferred, the, 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 the person was transferred to Malago, an died in Malago, although the Ministry of Health then reported the person died in IHK. But um, that, that uh, so the question really should be what, how does the Ministry of Health view the private sector in terms of uh, they can uh, play a role in this? Because if you're, if, if the private facilities are told this is the Ministry of then A, it gives them a and and uh, and B, it actually gives them. So uh, I don't know. Maybe uh, uh, Doctor Alara might be in a better position than me. Yeah. All right. We're going to we're going to put that to Doctor. Uh, there's also the issue of uh, the national health insurance. Uh, you did raise an issue with that. Let's put that to Doctor Olaro right now. Doctor Olaro. You did talk about national health insurance or insurance for all. Uh, from what Dr. Ian Clark said earlier on, it seems like 
the president, uh, parliament sent that to the president, the president is not quite in support. Uh, what's the status and how do we ensure that we have health insurance for all and especially the most vulnerable Ugandans? Thank you, Gabriel, again. Insurance definitely has been on the table for quite some time. As far as I know, is already with the committee of the Health Committee of Parliament, who is receiving views from the different stakeholders before it's presented to Parliament for the plenary. But as you know, definitely we are getting towards the campaign campaign period. So bottom line of it that health insurance remains one of the our key key priorities to address as part of our health financing strategy. So it's there. And I, I think we've done what is on our part as Minister of Health. Now we have handed it over to, to, to Parliament to deliberate, to, to deliberate, to legislate mm. on it. All right, in relation to those plans, because we've seen before Parliament passes something and after it's been passed, it's, everything is fine. They say, oh, but we don't have the resources for it in plan. Um, I, I think definitely by the time it, it, it passes, what, what's important first of all is for us to be able that they do pass it, then their discussion on the aspect of resources, that definitely will be a new, I think we first need to agree, I think in principle everybody agrees that insurance is necessary so that we can be able to provide services to each of us equitably across okay. across board. So I think is that's, there's no discussion about that. I think now is the process of us having it done is one which is which is which is quite slow. But we are waiting for Parliament to do its part, and if they need any more answers from us, the technical people, then we can be able to provide it. All right, Dr. Idro uh, Elizabeth Asege asks. If we say is if we want to deploy doctors to sub counties, we have to focus their training in family medicine. Otherwise, they get there and feel redundant, then abscond. This really raises the uh, bigger issue of abscondment. So you passionately talked about, you know, we have enough doctors to send, uh, and in five years we can have the numbers that we need uh, in every part of the country. But there's the issue of yes, you get deployed somewhere, and. Uh, you go and you fail to find the doctors that are supposed to be there. Uh, and there's a role uh, of your institution. Uh, the, there's a role your institution can play to ensure that those doctors are not just deployed, but they're actually offering the services there. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth, and uh, uh, for raising these concerns. Um, when the lockdown first occurred, um, there was the issue of stickers for health workers to be able to move. And many of the health services, um, we could hardly implement, many of us could hardly implement or even go to our health units. And the matter was that many of the health workers are staying quite some distance from the health units. A long time ago, for example, around Mulago, the areas which are near the, the run Mulago runabout, those houses were accommodated staff, but those units have been taken over and in the process we lost. So as Dr. Lara was indicating, many of the health workers have been unable to move. And one, there are two reasons uh, why um, many of the health workers may not also amenities, including accommodation, schools for their children, and that uh, that kind of uh, thing. And uh, and you'll recall that sometime back, Parliament made um, 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 uh, resources were allocated for doctors who will prefer who will allow to go to health center force, and they were given some uh, some allowances. And many of the health center force. At, actually got populated through this process because before that there were no doctors in those units and especially those which are near places where um, you have um, so some social amenities 
these are also human beings. They also require to have some social amenities, and especially those with families, for uh, those with families where their children need to go to school. So if these things can be addressed, it improves things en enormously. But what we are proposing is we have very many young people who are actually ready to go immediately after medical school. Um, they will be able to, um, to offer some of these services. Uh, universities like Mbarara University have a very good community program. And many of their doctors have been able to, to, to go up and take up some of this. So that the training, the, the currently even Makere University is doing a similar thing, a COBAS kind of thing. So where the students go and live in, some, some, uh, in a community, in, uh, in the health center force and in the, uh, in the district hospitals, and they get adapted to a, a state of living in, um, in rural communities. And many of these doctors are ad ad adaptable and uh, okay. this can be done. The only thing is to just phase it so that as Dr. Olara says, let's complete the health center force, then we can go to the health center threes. All right. Thank you, Dr. Idro. Dr. Idro and the rest of the panelists, we're going to come back to each one of you for uh, your parting shots. So could you please prepare for that? Uh, I have a comment here from Dr. Okuna Nevo. Uh, I, we did have her on uh, an earlier webinar. Uh, about the sector. And this is what she says in relation to the training of pharmacists uh, that Dr. Idro raised. Uh, and she says that uh, with regard to the training of pharmacists, uh, partnerships with public universities uh, for deliberate training of industrial pharmacists is part of the proposed pharmaceutical HR plans uh, which are underway. All right. Uh, Attendees, please continue to send your questions through. Our panelists are responding to them in the Q&A. I'd like to go to Dr. Kobusinje. You did raise the issue of uh, research and the fact that most of our research or a lot of our research is uh, donor funded, therefore focuses on uh, probably what the donors want. COVID-19 has brought to the surface many of the problems that People like you knew were there, but now we can focus on these things. Right. Yes, you, you are the one who asked the question, but I'd like to put it back to you. How do we make sure that we can focus our research so that our research is building our sectors for us, is responding to our problems? Where does the financing come from? Where can we start to identify that financing? Uh, thank you very much. So... Yeah, we always come back to the question of resources. Where are the resources going to come from? And I think it's that question has an, an underlying layer. What are our priorities? Because we are spending money. We are spending money on different kinds of things. Um, and I think we need to look, before we start thinking about, let's ask somebody else from out there to give us more money. Let's look at how we can make savings in our own, in, in the resources that we have in country. So first of all, if we, if we are determined to prioritize research that is a, a research agenda that is Ugandan, that has been generated by our own needs that we, and we'd like to address them and we make it a priority, then we look within our resources and we've already identified, for instance, the fact that we spend way too much money that we send abroad for people to get training, so to get medical care, so that we can cut back on. We can look at money that is spent within country um, on things that do not really contribute to the health of the people. For instance, you mentioned the four wheel drives. You have no idea the level of wastage that is in transportation that does not actually contribute to development. And I think if we, and again, it comes to governance, you know, if we really think about the resources and where they are going, we would quickly come to the conclusion that we can cut, a, we can make a lot of savings that then go into, um, into research that we are persuaded is a priority. So I think we need to look at the resources and how we spend them and that would, and you know, baby steps. Let me take from uh, I think it was um, Charles and uh, and Richard. You know, Dr. Idro. Let's begin where we are with what we have, and begin to use that. And we'll right. be surprised that actually we have 
enough to take care of our needs, or maybe not quite enough, but at least we have something to get us started. So let's look within and cut all that wastage and improve accountability. Huge sums of money get lost every year, every month, from, you know, from uh, corruption, from people taking money that doesn't belong to them. And I think if we are able to get the accountability right, then we'll be making savings that can drive um, research that, that's to our benefit. All right, uh, Dr. Olive, uh, Dr. Olaro touched on uh, the issue of uh, accidents, ambulances, black spots. Right. And uh, in the introduction, I did say that you're an injury epidemiologist and uh, you are a research fellow uh, uh, on uh, you know, trauma, injury, disability. Uh, your views on what we need to do uh, for that particular uh, uh, part of the sector. So this is one that it gives us the perfect opportunity to see a multi-sectoral, multidisciplinary approach to a problem. It usually shows up as a medical problem because you have an injured patient that's about to die on your hands. But really, when you look at the back of that, you see that there are several sectors that could have come together to, to prevent this problem. Uh, it was interesting, Dr. Olaro talked about 120 black spots across the country and that we are buying ambulances to cover those black spots. Actually, black spots don't fall from the sky. Black spots are produced by a road network that is not appropriate for the use. You know, you have school kids crossing very busy um, roads, you know, you have... so. These different sectors, you know, um, Ministry of Works and Transport, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Internal Affairs through policing, all of these can come together and say, listen, the, and, and uh, Miriam in her introduction talked about data and how data can drive health decisions. So if we know that these areas have a lot of road traffic crashes, they're having people dying from road traffic crashes, these different sectors can come together and say, how do we fix this? What needs to change in the way the road is designed, the way it is used, the way it is policed? Where do we need to have what kind of services? So I think that can be solved through use of data and having these multiple sectors come together. Because the health sector is usually at the receiving end. We see the patient once they are injured, but there's a lot that happens before that patient winds up on the road that could be sorted and I think that is another opportunity for savings because once a patient is injured, the level of, of the cost to the healthcare system is horrendous. And yet that's something that could be a saving if there's the right road network, you know, the right policing, the right uh, education and community sensitization. So let's get these sectors to work together. And once we make the savings in health, then those savings can now go into either research or improving other services. All right, thank you very much. Uh, you actually have raised uh, the next thing I wanted to go to. Uh, Dr. Miriam raised the issue of data quite a bit and we haven't really focused on that and we're running out of time. So I'd just like us to talk a bit about data and I'll start with Dr. Ian Clark, how it's being used in the private sector and the opportunities that uh, we, we should be harnessing uh, so that our planning is more targeted. Sometimes the data collection in the private sector is a black hole. None of the deficiencies in the sector. The Health Federation has been working to try and improve the, you know, the and make it uh, user friendly. The uh, electronic data connection, uh, data uh, collection. That that um, that, that uh, organ uh, organization I, I mentioned. Uh, like what was it called? Anyway, the one that Kasiji Hospital is using is actually um, trying to plug that gap. So I think we need to use these things so that we, we, we tie in with the um, Ministry of Health data collection system itself. One of the things for me is where we all represent the health sector. I mean, it's just, it's, what, it's all for the good of the health of our citizens. And when I look here at the, even the, the, the uh, constituents of this panel, uh, there is quite a dense. I take all of us an academic, <laughs> and uh, and various. Uh, and I think uh, apart from James McGarrow, I think I'm the only um, private sector person on it. So, 
so I'm still coming back to my, and I'll make this my closing remarks, I'm still coming back to my issue of that we should look sector-wide and make sure that there's this disparity, you know, between the private, that the public sector collects data, the private sector doesn't, for example, or the public sector does this and the private sector. And I, I, I personally think what we need is a, a health sector commission with impartial leadership where we have representation right across the sector to see how we can actually meet the health sector needs instead of this kind of dichotomy between PNFP, your for profit public sector, because we're, we're serving the same people. So, and then some of these gaps and, and so on would be formed. You can you sometimes need a multi sectoral approach. We don't even have a sector wide approach as far as many of these issues are concerned. So, yeah, that would be my observation. Thank you very much, Dr. Ian Clark, a health sector commission. Uh, I wonder how uh, Dr. Olaro is going to respond to that, but I'm very keen to hear your response to that. And uh, uh, Dr. Ian Clark, if uh, uh, please stay with us uh, because uh, other issues may arise for you. But now I'd like to go back to uh, Dr. Miriam. And uh, since we've had, you know, all the panelists have uh, touched on things that you raised in the think piece, uh, there are a number of them, and we don't have much time. So I'd just like to uh, come back to you and basically give you the liberty uh, to probably clarify if there are any clarifications to be made and uh, uh, let us know uh, how we will be proceeding, especially with the think piece that was given. Uh, Dr. Miriam? Uh, doctor, you're still muted. So if you could unmute, we just missed uh, what, you, what you said. Excellent. Sorry, thank you very much, Gabriel, and uh, all the panelists for enriching uh, the discussion. I've taken note of all your points and um, uh, definitely um, they've uh, thrown light on some of the ideas we've had. And what I particularly picked up was the, uh, what Dr. Kadama said about socializing the health sector. We very much approach it from the traditional perspective because that's the way we were trained. But we do recognize that um, the society or community has a role to play in terms of uh, demanding for the, for the services. But I do think to effectively socialize this health sector, the population should have a minimum level of education. And this is where the multi-sectoral approach is important because uh, education should be able to build a foundation and within that education, the values of, of uh, valuing your own health and deliberately working towards personal health is important. But a well-educated uh, community would be able to um, contribute and critique the health sector constructively Many times uh, the health sector gets bashing. People are bashing the doctors, the nurses, the, you know, the whole structure, but um, we do need some um, constructive criticism so that we can build towards satisfying the users. Um, I also think that uh, the governance of the health sectors could be enriched with uh, maybe a leadership and management unit within our undergrad training because many of us have been put in leadership at the facility with no idea what it takes, but uh, somehow we've swam through the waters full of sharks and uh, you see the health units running. So I don't blame the health workers too much on um, the way the facilities are managed because it's the way we're trained. But finally, I'd like to throw in the idea of uh, an incubation hub for the young brains that join the health sector to creatively come up with innovative ways of delivering healthcare services, collecting data and many and using the technology that's out there to improve the way we um, provide our services. And um, with that, uh, I, I, I once again want to thank all the panelists for the ideas they've put out here and we shall certainly uh, work on, on uh, improving our document. Thank you very much. Gabriel, I hand back to you. 
All right, all right. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, I had Dr. Ian Clark had mentioned that was his final remark. I'm just checking if he is still on. Dr. Ian Clark, are you still there? Yeah, yes, yeah, so I'm here. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, I just uh, I would like your opinion on uh, uh, what Dr. Miriam has ended with on uh, harnessing the, the the brains of the young people. And uh, one of the things we've seen uh, under COVID-19 is that uh, young people are actually quite innovative. And I don't know, are we limiting them when it comes to the health sector? Because it's one of those sectors that is uh, quite sensitive. Are we, uh, you know, uh, not giving them the opportunity to, uh, to think about different ways in which health can be delivered to the people? Yeah, I mean, uh... Innovation and young people um, in the health sector is actually very, very relevant. I mean, I attended some conference in Nairobi uh, where there were young Ugandans who had come out with tremendous devices. One young guy had come out with a probe that you could use on a smartphone uh, to do uh, echo, to do, I think he was, he was, he was actually using, doing CTGs uh, and scans. And I, but I, I think one of his problems was we never really got the support he needed to develop it. I think he even went to North America at one point. Um, but I also know groups of young people, as I mentioned in my own presentation, uh, like Clinic Tessa, uh, like Streamline, who are doing actually very, very useful work in the healthcare. I think we need to um, encourage, definitely encourage this, in this, this work. When you put a health sector per, per person together with a with a with a coder, and uh, you so you put the IT and you put the, uh, the, the 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 health sector person together, they actually come up with great solutions. Uh, and uh, I've seen this. There's a program we run called the which is uh, which is which is also in this. So yeah, it's a very very good point in terms of the innovation that can be offered because the way ahead is to to overcome many of our issues is technology, and if we harness technology right. Uh, there, there is, we can overcome a lot of the physical infrastructure problems. You know, we can do the leapfrogging, as has been done by, by uh, mobile technology. So, yeah, very, very important. Thanks. All right. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ian Clark. I'd like to go to Dr. Idro uh, for your closing, your parting shot, Dr. Idro. We thank um, uh, Castle for inviting UMA to, to this discussion. Um, uh, thank you very much, Miriam, for raising this. And uh, thank you for, to all the panelists. Um, uh, it has brought out uh, important uh, areas for discussions, the role of innovations, uh, urban health, which we have not discussed extensively here, but how do we do things differently, the role of the different hospitals, some of which Dr. Olara has uh, mentioned. But um, as, um, for us concerning us directly as um, health workers, we, we, are, we are available, we are open to, to discussions, open to criticism and um, the innovative ideas, especially that proposed from the young people, um, I think can come if this plat uh, such platforms are, are offered. And indeed, um, thinking through the layout of infrastructure, uh, one, or two th one thing which I didn't mention is the, we may need to change the, the infrastructure bit going forward, including our dressing that may have to use more scrubs for infection, uh, infection prevention and control um, engineering designs so that the where hospitals come, patients coming through that uh, hand washing facilities, even in the wards, some of the things have to be to be changed. Uh, to be changed, and um, we'll uh, we'll be uh, happy to participate more in this, even in uh, in future such such discussions if uh, in if invited. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Idro. Like we mentioned, this is the thirteenth. We still have a number of webinars to go, uh, so most likely we may be uh, we will be calling on, upon you again. But for each one of us, 
Every week we have a different sector. So check in with us and see what sector we're handling each week so that uh, you can join the discussion. If you miss any of them, go to our Facebook pages, uh, Castle Org, uh, and you'll be able to follow the discussion there even after the live presentations. I'd like now to go to uh, Dr. Olive. Um, thank you very much, uh, Gabriel. Uh, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, I'm going to uh, again repeat myself over. We, we, so we need to get the governance right. We need to fix the, the accountability. Uh, so we have great policies and, and even right here, we, we have made you know, very good proposals about what else we can add, what else needs adjustments. Um, and they are all going to either fail or succeed uh, based on how, whether we get the accountability and governance right. And I'm very optimistic. I think that the pandemic has given us the opportunity to really be determined to not let things go. I think there was a sense of resignation. What do you do? You can always find a ticket and go to Nairobi. But I think this, I think this has been a game changer and I'm very optimistic that um, this community, not just the medical community, but um, a wider civil society that is concerned with health, with equity in health, will we'll make sure that we don't lose the lessons and that we, we actually harness the gains uh, despite the devastation of the pandemic. So I'm very enthusiastic and I really thank Castle for leading this and for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Olive. Before I invite back our uh, special guest uh, to respond to some of the things raised and to also give closing uh, his closing uh, or parting shot, I'd like to ask the technical team to uh, display our uh, next uh, opinion question. Technical team, could we please have the opinion poll? Oh, there it is. What can be done to improve health delivery systems in Uganda? Can we focus on prevention at household and community level? Increase funding to health sector to 15% of national budgetary allocation as agreed at Abuja declaration in 2001. Strengthen the referral system to avoid overcrowding at the regional referral hospitals and eradicate corruption in the sector uh, because the sector has adequate resources. Almost all these things have been discussed during the webinar. And so uh, we're actually getting your opinion after you have uh, received the information. But let's see uh, what option people will, majority of us will take. At the moment, majority of us are saying eradicate corruption. The sector has adequate resources. Uh, with the way this poll is going, uh, Dr. Olaro, you may have to adjust your closing remarks because uh, majority are saying, you know, uh, we should, where we should improve is eradication of corruption because the sector has adequate resources. Uh, in a few seconds, that poll will end. All right, let's end it here. And uh, the final, well, the question is, what can be done to improve health delivery systems in Uganda? And 73% of uh, the attendees because the panelists uh, cannot take this vote. 73% of the attendees at the end of this webinar are saying eradicate corruption. The sector has adequate resources. Over to you, Dr. Olaro. Thank, thank you, Gabriel, for first of all, for giving me this opportunity to to speak during this webinar and I thank the organizers. Uh, the dialogue really is the one way to go, but also I would want to echo, re-echo that to my fellow countrymen that definitely have, have optimism. And each of us definitely has got a key role to, to produce. If you look at definitely the, the, the building blocks, all those issues definitely fall there. Issues of leadership, and I think we need to have a deliberate investment on building leadership issues. 
because all of you have had the fish rots from the head. So you really need to be able to see that when we entrust, because we, we even as we, we do see that sometimes institutions definitely have the same resources, but definitely the outputs which come from them are, are different. So we really need to be able to, to, to do that. Currently, the ministry is investing on the digitalizing the health management information system. And I think this year we are going to begin up with the regional hospitals, then we roll it to general hospitals and then to the lower health facilities so that you have this information which can be able to provide evidence for all the decisions which you are mentioning. Accountability, I think is you will have accountability at individual level. And I think we want to look at it cutting across. Financial ac accountability is definitely at a higher level. But if you look at an individual level, what is your accountability? What's your responsibility? What's your responsibility now if we look at COVID? Because you not adhere to the, but still the problem will come. The health sector has not been able to provide what. So uh, accountability is broad, as an individual, as institutions, as a country, is one of those tenants which we definitely need to be able to emphasize and uh, and to be seen doing. There are opportunities which have come out of COVID, which I think as the health sector. Will, we need to grab them and be able to run with them and be able to sustain the health system so that even after COVID, actually what we, all our investment now is not just looking at COVID, it's looking at now with COVID and beyond COVID. So I know my colleague Grace have the issues of the black spots. I agree with her partly, but yes, one of it can be on designs, but also whether we will all without black the black spots will keep emerging. So you will definitely need to invest in the good referral emergency medical system. So ladies and gentlemen, it has been a pleasure really meet it, attending this discussion. And uh, I am going back very knowledgeable on a number, of, a number of things. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ol uh, Charles Olaro, who has been our special guest for today's webinar. And all our panelists, Dr. Olive uh, Kobusinje, Dr. Ian Clark, Dr. Richard Idro, and uh, uh, Dr. Patrick Kadama, who had to log out and therefore could not participate at, at this point where we were taking uh, the questions. Uh, but we thank you all. And of course, uh, Dr. Miriam Mutabazi, uh, who presented the Think Peace on behalf of uh, CASO. Uh, thank you very much. We're coming to the end. But just before we close for today, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. James Magara, uh, the board chairperson for CASO, to give some closing remarks and probably a way forward, and then we'll be able uh, to close in prayer. Dr. Magara. Yeah, thank you very much, Gabriel. And uh, very, very special thanks to Dr. Charles Solaro and uh, our other panelists, uh, Dr. Kadama, Dr. Olive Kobsinje, Dr. Idro, Dr. Ian Clark, thank you so much for, we, we, call, we say you, you lent us your brains this morning. Uh, thank you so much. It's been uh, very engaging. I've uh, been following all through. And uh, one of the things that has amazed us throughout this, um, it's about 13 weeks now, is just the, the, the quality of thinking that we have in the country. There, we, almost every sector you go to, and if you look hard enough, you'll find people who are so knowledgeable. But the other thing that has surprised us is uh, how little that is used. Um, and in some, in some of our meetings, we've had people say, well, this is the first time we're engaging like this. Um, I believe that in the health sector, it's been different, but a lot more can happen in terms of uh, wiring this brain together. And this is really the advantage of uh, this kind of engagements. Um, everybody looks at things from a different perspective. And uh, from our areas of expertise, we see things that other people don't see. And so our uh, sessions like this help us, if we will listen um, and take note, to come up with the best ideas. The great thing about engaging in things like this is when the decisions are made, the people who get the credit are the ones who are leading. So we do hope that uh, some of the things that have come out today will be uh, of use 
as we usually do, we we, we have rapporteurs who have been who have been following, and uh, the next level will be to distill the ideas that have come out. Uh, the panelists will all get copies of of what we've uh, discussed, um, and then uh, we are still working on another aspect, which is just synthesizing and bringing out policy briefs, which can be used by legislators and people like that. So. Thank you very, very much for lending us your brains. And I'd like to thank the, the participants as well for engaging, but also being there um, and uh, you know, being following the, the conversation. Uh, we look forward to engage. We do hope that these meetings also create um, linkages so that out of this meeting, other people will contact you because of what they have heard you say, but also among self panelists that ideas can be followed up and taken to another level. I've, uh, I had sometimes I was just saying, wow, 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 because I was learning a lot as as uh, as uh, you all presented. So thank you very much once again. And uh, next week, I think they'll introduce, uh, we'll talk more about it. We're looking at another sector, a sector of tourism. And we hope that you can join, join us uh, beyond your sector, because one of the other challenges we've noted is how we have a lot of silo thinking. We tend to think in one segment only. And uh, one of you mentioned uh, the, the, the fact that everything is intellect. The world is a system. So you touch one area, there's an impact on another. And I think that's a very big lesson that uh, this pandemic has taught us. So it's just, it looked like one issue, a health issue, but look at what has happened. It has touched every single sector and uh, just caused some of the most unimaginable things in the world. Last night I was watching a football match and I, I just couldn't bring myself to think that a football match between Bayern Munich and Barcelona has an empty stadium. I, I, I just couldn't. <laughs> but it came out of one thing, it came out of the health sector. So the more we think across sectors, the more likely we are to get solutions that actually work. Well, I'm not a panelist, but I just uh, represent Castle here and uh, thank you for your all your contribution. Should I hand, hand back to you uh, Gabriel? Doctor, why don't you uh, also close in prayer? And then we'll, oh, yeah, we'll I'll be do able that. to move on. <clears throat> Lord, thank you so much for the, the giftedness our country has, not just in natural resources, but in people. And uh, the many learned people that we have in this country. And we just pray as we move forward uh, from this uh, webinar that you will help us to put these ideas to use and not just be a talking shop, but uh, help us to put the ideas that have come up here to improve our country. Thank you for all who have participated and we pray you bless our weekend and bless the rest of this week that's ahead of us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, thank you very much, Dr. Magara. And a special thank you to all our panelists and every attendee. We're back next Saturday, starting at 9 a.m. We will send you an email uh, to remind you to uh, register for the webinar. So please join the webinar, whether you are in the sector we'll be discussing or not. Uh, like has been emphasized, all these sectors are interlinked. Until next time, thank you very much. Uh, goodbye and God bless you.